checking in with society, with groups, with friends. Um, you know, many, many years ago, over 40 years ago, I was at a conference. It was an independent living conference in Washington, D.C., quite a long time ago. And um, um, just to do a, a, a self ex explanation, a visual explanation, I am a woman that's in her 60s. I'm a white woman, but I look 50. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> all right, yeah, maybe 59, I don't know. Uh, anyway, I haven't been able to see good for a long time, so I just make believe I still look like I was 30. Um, anyway, um, over 40 years ago, I did attend an independent living um, conference in Washington, D.C., so long time ago in the 1970s, because I have been a long time advocate for disability rights. Within that conference, there was a lot of discussion about access. We all know the word access is a very general term. And at that time, the major thing that we were discussing was the built environment and accessibility to buildings. So we discussed things like ramps and curb cuts and elevators in buildings, because at the time, many, if not most of our public buildings were not accessible to many of my friends in the disability community with mobility impairments. And that was really such a major focus. As we fast forward to 2022, we've done a lot of work in the area of access and physical built environment. We have a lot more to go. But at this point in time, it's really the information technology that we have to look at in the accessibility to the information. We use information in all and digital information in all aspects of our life. People waking up with their iPhone and going on to uh, your PC or signing up to go to an event or whatever you might do in the workplace. So most of us are interacting with, with IT. And having the access to do that, number one, that you have the broadband capability, for instance, that if you're a person from low income um, family and, and don't have the uh, internet connection, very, very important since so much of the world is through the digital space. Um, also, if you live in a, in a wooded area or a rural area, that's very important for accessibility. But other than that basic access to having internet, there's also the access needed for individuals that work with um, assistive technology. So many of us um, individuals with disabilities who are in every demographic area, um, every demographic population of individuals has individuals with disabilities. Um, and it is so important if we're using assistive technology and for many other reasons, we'll hear more about them today, that information is accessible to all of us. So I'm so happy that everyone's here today. I just wanna welcome you and we have some, a great program lined up. And um, let me introduce my general counsel. And Julia O'Leary, who is going to be the major master of ceremonies. Thank you, Mary. Good morning, everyone. Um, whether you're here joining us uh, in person or via live stream, we're so happy to have you as part of this event. Um, it's a really powerful feeling to be here surrounded by a community of people committed to accessibility for people with disabilities. We're all here today because of that commitment. Um, as Mary said, today's theme is accessibility in a digital world. Um, as you all know too well, a fully, accessible, a fully accessible digital world is far from being realized. But today we'll hear from several individuals and groups who have made their corner of the digital world a little more accessible. Um, we hope you can learn from them, uh, from others you meet here today. Um, and if you're joining us in live stream, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat and share what you're hoping to learn. If you're here in person, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, the restrooms are down this hallway that you came in on and then to the left. 
Uh, if you need uh, an accommodation during the event, please raise your hand and we'll have someone come over and find you. And Mary, do you wanna take it? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I got it. Um, so uh, first speaker is the esteemed Secretary Curtis Hood. And it's, it's wonderful because uh, of my 34 years working for the Commonwealth, um, I haven't had the opportunity to work with many cabinet level people. Um, I haven't been at a point where they would know my name, <laughs> but um, I can tell you that this gentleman and I in a team of other people have been working closely very recently and he completely understands the importance of digital accessibility. It's, it's critically important and we're working on projects to improve the, the governance and the oversight and the, um, you know, just that, in, that information technology is accessible for all. It's a, it's a human right, it's a disability right. And um, so it's my pleasure anyway at this time to introduce Secretary Curtis Wood, who's the Secretary of the Executive Office of Information Technology Services and Security. Our systems. Thank you. Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, Hopefully I don't mess that up. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. I was here a few years ago too, I think, uh, at, at, uh, I think the last in person one, I believe. Uh, so I'm familiar with the venue and surely the community. Uh, Mary said, you know, I'm Kurt Wood. I'm the, uh, I'm, I'm, I have the privilege and honor of serving with Governor Baker's administration uh, as a cabinet secretary and chief information officer for the Commonwealth of Mass. Uh, secretary Heffernan, my counterpart, I uh, couldn't make it today, so I'm going to try to fill in his big shoes as well a little bit. Uh, one thing I'll say about our administration, our cabinet, you know, uh, there's nine cabinet secretaries, and uh, I'm the uh, I'm the newest one, but I'm actually probably the most years. I've got, I started in the state when I was 19, uh, 1975, um, so about 48 years. Uh, and, you know, I've certainly, over the years, um, you know, I've progressed through, you know, the different organizations, mostly public safety. My career has mostly been in public safety. Um, last four years serving in this administration as the cabinet secretary for IT and digital and security. Um, and what I would say is that, you know, when I first, you know, came to state government, you know, you know, Mary talked about ramps and I used to work in, a, I started my career in a prison. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I went home every day, but I started my career in a prison. Uh, but, you know, you know, we didn't even think about those things, right? We just, we just didn't. And honestly, uh, through my career, I've been, I've been blessed with some great opportunities, great jobs, and meeting some great people. You know, both from the workforce and certainly the constituents that we all serve, uh, and we're obligated to serve, and we should, we should serve, right? Uh, and one thing over the years has driven me right out of my mind is the checklist mentality, right? And uh, you know. In this space here, uh, especially around IT, uh, you know, uh, we don't we, we've never done enough. You know, we've really actually in digital and digital is fairly new term that we use, right? Because you know things have changed. When I first started, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how a fax machine worked. You know what I mean? So or TV. Uh, so you know, we have certainly matured in our technology capacity, but I think it's honest. It, it's it's fair to say that, you know, we've not, you know done a great job of thinking about, you know, a wider audience and understanding the importance and criticality, you know, uh, Mary used the word accessibility access, right? And you think about that and, it, and it, it's, it's a big, it's actually a big word. It's a simple word, but it's a big word and has a lot of meaning. Uh, and since I've been the secretary since 18, uh, you know, I used to be on the other side and I Sarah here from our team, uh, you know, great, great resource, great worker, great person in our organization for the years. But I remember being on the other side was public safety and our whole objective was to avoid that, right? We'd hire, we, we, would, we would look for a public safety exception on accessibility, like, like 
thinking like Neanderthals, like none of our workforce might have a disability, right? Now, never mind our constituents, right? Um, so we went in there and with the whole purpose of avoiding this and just getting a waiver. And that was the whole culture, right? So I come into this role and amazingly for all the criticisms I used to make at this organization, I found the light and said, wow, I have an opportunity to really do something different. And I started thinking about this differently and you think about access and again, we started our journey on, you know, improved citizen services, improved digital experience for our customers, our your residents, our visitors, and our business like Commonwealth. And we kind of still forget about our workforce. You know, it's like, wow. And I think, you know, honestly, during the pandemic, um, you know, I think, and I've mentioned a couple of folks here today, I think the pandemic, if anything, you know, if silver lining, it really gave us an opportunity to think differently about how we work and how we live. And it really made us uh, think about more importantly about the people that needed access to state services or needed access to government, just needed to have access to live their life like their counterparts, right? At the end of the day. Um, and I remember getting into this discussion with my team. You know, we went to Microsoft 365 in the cloud, multi-factor authentication. We got teams, we got all this great stuff. We're just rocking and rolling. We're great patting ourselves on the back. Somebody said, well, you know, that's great, but it doesn't really work for everybody. And we're like, what do you mean it doesn't work for everybody? It's, it's great. It's part of the license. We paid 33 bucks a license. You get everything here. And some of our comrades, and I'm not going to mention what's Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, you know, would say, well, it doesn't really work for the public. It really doesn't work for a community that you're kind of forgetting about. You know, and it was like a wake-up call and a smack in the face, right? I said, hmm. And of course, going back to your IT people, and I'm not an IT person by trade. I just happened to complain back in 1994 and I ended up being a CIO. And I, that's how I got into IT. I don't know how I did it. Anyway, so we went back and started thinking about this. You know, we've got to think about this differently. You know, so we, we adjusted and it wasn't easy trying to get, you know, the hardcore IT people that are stuck in the way they want to do stuff. So, oh, that's not really, we can't do that. It's one standard, that's it. So we adjusted and we made some progress. It was not perfect, but it gave us an opportunity internally in my organization at the executive office of technology service and security to really kind of think about that you know we have a larger mission here we need to take a lead i have an opportunity as a cabinet secretary to make a difference right i can make a difference if i'm at an agency sometimes you just don't make a difference you can't you can't get the audience you can't get to where you need to go and certainly the folks that work day to day that are in this community they can't get the voice either i can get the voice i sit at the governor's table I sit with Secretary Heffern. I sit with my fellow cabinet secretary, Secretary Sutters. Anybody know Secretary Sutters? I mean, half of state government, 54% of state government, right? She has a big voice, right? She's been after me for years to deal with this, right? And I said, okay. Uh, so that being said, all that said, uh, you know, we have put together a group, you know, Mary's my co-chair, uh, you know, to really rethink about this. We brought somebody in, you know, uh, we brought Deloitte in to help us think a little bit. And we're, we're about to publish a roadmap and we're about really to think about differently. And my objective here really is to, <clears throat> you know, change, you know, and, you know, certainly our administration is ending. I'll be gone in January, uh, but we want to make sure that we can present this opportunity in this, this must, this is a must. It's not, it's an opportunity, but it's a must for our next administration to consume this. We need to make a stand. We need to change the way we think about things, you know, and certainly, you know, our workforce, our constituents, you know, and that, when I talk about, accessibility. Again, it's certainly from a workforce perspective, it's also to making sure that, you know, we can meet the needs of our people, our businesses, our residents, our business, the Commonwealth as well, because it is important. And if you do not have access to, you know, information today, if you do not have access to the digital tools or the, or the ability to, you know, uh, be equal with everybody else and have that opportunity, that's unacceptable. And that's just totally unacceptable. And we have a responsibility. I have a responsibility, you know, as a cabinet secretary, and my, and my success will have that responsibility to make sure, you know, that we focus on this and we get this done. And it can't be a one-stop. It has to be evolution. It has to be built into our DNA. It has to be part of our fabric, who we are as a commonwealth. We are a commonwealth. We are a collective group of individuals that work together, play together, live together, all that stuff. We have a responsibility to each other. You have a responsibility to hold us accountable. I have a responsibility to hold my team accountable, myself accountable. We can't do this alone. We need to make this really a community effort. So, you know, my commitment today is to make sure that everybody understands my office. I'm going to do everything I can possible between now and December, between January, to make sure this gets advanced. And I, and I suspect it will. All right. We have funding lined up. We have everything working in place. It's not going to be easy. 
There's going to be some bumps. We're going to depend on this community to be guide us in an advisory capacity to make sure that we're we're going about it the right way. And there's a voice, and you'll always have a voice. And that that to me is really, really the most important thing that I can leave this administration because I think I take this very much. I, I take this very personal. Um, you know, it's long overdue. It's unacceptable with the lack of you know, that checklist mentality and just try to avoid doing something because it's too hard or, you know, you're not worrying about it. You don't really think about it, right? We need to think about this. So as cabinet secretary, I'm going to move that forward. Uh, today, uh, you know, this is a great conference. I've been to one before, you know, having the collective group here talking and sharing information and experiences is just tremendous and keep this on the front burner. Again, I want to thank you on behalf of certainly my team, but also Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito and Secretary Heffernan. You know, this is a great Great effort, and we're gonna get we're gonna get this done because the people who are gonna follow me, I'm gonna make sure because I'll come back and haunt them. I retired once in '97, and I came back, came back for a, a year. I came back, and I've been back 20, so I may come back. I'm 67, but I I'm actually got my first Social Security check this week, just so you know. I'm actually a senior citizen. Uh, all kidding aside, we need to get this done. You need to keep us honest. You need to drive this, and we will make sure that when we follow up with this new group and we have this advisory group that there is a voice and there's a driving, there's accountability at the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to get this done once and for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Wood. Um, today's event is hosted by Mass General Brigham. Thank you all to our hosts. Um, I'd, we'd now like to welcome Carla Carton and Dr. Adam Landman from Mass General Brigham for a brief welcome message. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to this shared space. Welcome to a space where I was just so inspired by uh, by what Mr. Wood just said, Secretary Wood just said, um, because we are here not to check things off of a box. We are not things to be checked off of a box. We are breathing, functional, warm human beings that can make a difference when we come together and say we wanna make a difference. My name is Carla Carton and I am the Interim Diversity, Equity and uh, Inclusion Officer for Mass General Brigham. And we have been working collaboratively with the Massachusetts Office on Disability to be able to bring this conference to you, to bring this summit to you, to bring it alive. I am actually shaking in my boots because I actually had a prepared speech and decided that what I would really like to do is speak from the heart. And my heart is driving me to say, you know, we are a community that has this beautiful opportunity in this moment to come together and spend time together to say, what do we want to do? What have we done? What is the best of what we have done? And what can we do together to move forward? One of the things that we've done at Mass General Brigham, especially since COVID, and the theme of COVID keeps coming up again and again and again, because as mentioned, perhaps a silver lining in this horrible, horrible disease has been a new awakening, a new awakening to how in home environments and in our workforce and in our hospital systems where we thought we were really on target and had accessibility at our forefront because it's one of our core, core, um, our core ideals, we weren't ma making the mark. We were missing the mark. We realized that we had uh, vast opportunities to make sure that all of the information that we were giving people to be safe, that we thought we were providing, we weren't providing in the ways that we thought we should. And we didn't know that before COVID. So COVID opened up our eyes, our minds, our bodies, our spirits to really come together to say, what systems do we need to put in place if we really do have accessibility at our core? Now, I'll tell you another reason why I'm kind of shaken in my boots and excited to be here. I have a son. His name is Daniel. Daniel just turned 20. Daniel is very well rooted on the autism spectrum. And as I mentioned, Daniel is 20. So for you, those of you who are in this space with me, 
you know, some of the things that are happening to me as his mother cognitively when I say that he is 20 out loud. Daniel, when we talk about having a voice, Daniel would not have a voice without his adaptive communication device. The grace of being present with Daniel allows me to be in the space and grace with you to make sure that I am bringing his spirit, your spirits, and all of our spirits into the work that we do. So without much further ado, I just want to thank you for coming together today. Thank you for sharing this space. Thank you for being active in this space. And thank you for inspiring all the people who have leadership responsibilities in this space to stay active, to stay committed, and stay maybe just a little bit afraid of uh, Secretary Wood when he says he's going to come back and, uh, and keep us accountable. Um, one of the things that I that I am I, that I am thrilled with with today's program is again to be able to shed a a light and a highlight on disability justice and health equity through the digital space. And what I want to do now is I want to share the stage with uh, Dr. Adam Landman. Dr. Landman is our chief information officer, and he's also an emergency medical medicine physician. And he has done wonderful things in this space. He's got wonderful ideas. And, uh, and I'm just so inspired to share his insights, thoughts, and wisdom with us now. Thanks so much, um, Carla, first for the inspiring words um, and for the um, nice introduction. Um, as Carla shared, um, first, I want to reiterate, I am also um, a true believer, like um, like everyone has just described. And, and I also, during COVID, really learned what it means around accessibility and how we need to change. Um, and I um, am one of the leaders on the Mass General Brigham digital team. Um, and I'm going to share that we absolutely care about this and are committed to digital accessibility. And I'm going to share with you now, just for a few moments, a couple of examples of the work that we're doing. The first, um, we recently launched a new website for Mass General Brigham. It's massgeneralbrigham.org. Um, we are bringing lots of new features to help our patients and improve their experience, such as finding the, the most appropriate provider and also for booking appointments with us online. But we also recognize that we need to make this site digital accessible. And so I'm pleased to share that um, this site is meeting compliance with the web content and accessibility guidelines. Um, and as one, um, one quick example of that, the images on the website um, also have alternative text and so that that text can be read by screen readers. In another example, um, we want to make sure that we can provide services um, to those who need interpretation services. And so we are now using iPads equipped with specialized software that can bring virtual interpreters to our patients wherever they are. So whether there's a patient on an inpatient hospital floor or when in one of our ambulatory clinics, we can eat very quickly and easily wheel in a cart um, that has an iPad attached to it, and we can very quickly, instantly um, bring in an interpreter. And this can help patients um, that need American Sign Language interpretation and also patients that have li limited English um, proficiency. <clears throat> we are um, introducing lots of new digital tools to help improve the patient experience. We wanna make sure that all of our patients can have access and enjoy those experiences, such as being able to access our patient portal called Patient Gateway, or be able to use virtual visits. Um, and so in partnership with the Office of the Chief Medical Officer under our United Against Racism initiative, we launched a program called Digital Access Coordinators. We're putting bilingual staff directly into our community practices. And these staff, their, their primary purpose is to connect with our patients patients and help them enroll in our digital tools and use our digital tools. And we've increased by thousands the number of patients that are now able to access and use Patient Gateway, our portal. Similarly, on the North Shore, Salem Hospital and North Shore Physicians Group, um, in, their, um, in their regular community, um, community health outreach survey, they identified that 
patients had challenges with travel um, and also with access to technology. And so in order to help address those issues for our patients, um, Salem Hospital launched a mobile community health van and you're seeing that um, on the right side of the screen. And this community health van is equipped with modern technology, including mobile communications technologies. And so the staff on these vans can access all of the MGB digital systems and have access to all of the patient's records in an instant. Further, just like the digital access coordinators, they also have bilingual staff that can work with the patients to sign them up for Gateway and help them use our digital tools. I wanna share just two more very novel solutions that we're working on really that I think are at the cutting edge. The first is that, as you know, we're still in the COVID pandemic and now we also have monkeypox. And there are a lot of questions from patients about these um, conditions. As you might imagine, that can overwhelm our clinic staff and our call centers. And so we're starting to leverage novel artificial intelligence chatbots to help provide this information. And again, we are making sure that these are um, compliant um, with best practices for digital accessibility so they can be made available to all patients. And finally, I wanna share one really novel innovation from our colleagues at Mass Eye and Ear, which is our specialty hospital. And they care for many patients that have visual impairment. And one of the researchers there actually built um, an app that runs on iPhones and Android devices that turns that device into a digital magnifying glass. And um, one example is using the iPad to magnify the content on a um, prescription medication label so that patients with visual impairment can read it. This app is freely available. It's called Supervision, um, and I encourage um, all of you to check it out. Um, finally, I just want to say that um, I've shared some examples with you and we are making good progress, but we are by no means um, completely um, where we need to be. There is a lot more work that needs to be done and we are really grateful and honored to be able to be surrounded by this incredibly talented and expert community. Really, we look forward to working with you to improve digital accessibility in, um, at Mass General Brigham within the Commonwealth and really for everyone across the country. Um, and thank you all, look forward to today's event. Thank you, Carla and um, Adam, and thank you to Mass General Brigham for hosting our event today. And we're so grateful for your support of the summit and your commitment to accessibility. I, I'd like to now introduce Lainey Feingold, our esteemed keynote speaker. Lainey is a disability rights lawyer, author, and pioneer in both the digital accessibility and legal space and in collaborative problem solving. Since 1995, she has negotiated close to 100 groundbreaking settlement agreements, all without filing a single lawsuit. She's been recognized as both the problem solver of the year and a legal rebel by the American Bar Association. Lainey is committed to MOD's vision of a more accessible digital world, and we're so excited to welcome her here to kick off our program. I think we're gonna see the slides. Yes. Okay, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm Lainey Feingold. Thank you, Julia, for that really nice introduction. Um, I did get the legal rebel designation from the American Bar Association a couple of years ago. They pick 10 to 20 lawyers every year. And I'm like, why should being collaborative be rebellious? Like, shouldn't all lawyers be collaborative? Like, why should working on digital accessibility be a rebel thing? So I was glad to get it because it sounds kind of cool, but, you know, it really, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be a rebel. Um, okay, so um, I titled this slide, Massachusetts, a digital accessibility leader. And I think we've seen some of that leadership already this morning. And yes, there's a long way to go, but we're gonna talk about a lot of the leadership 
that's already been shown in Massachusetts. I am going to lower this one second because I'm probably the shortest person and I don't want to stand on tiptoes for the presentation. Um, so my title slide has my name. It has my website, which is lflegal.com, where you can do deep dives into many of the things I'll talk about today. I'm on Twitter, which is a great place for digital accessibility information at lflegal. Um, I have a dolphin in the background of this slide and some other slides. And I use a dolphin kind of as my, I don't wanna say brand, but too many people think to get stuff done that involves civil rights, you have to be a shark. And I found out about a book a couple of years ago called Teaching Baby Sharks to Swim, which was a book about how to teach new lawyers, how to be lawyers. And I'm like, I need another animal because if I say shark, what do you think of, you know? bloody and fear and danger and who wants to achieve things with that. So I adopted the dolphin to represent the qualities that I've already seen in the talks and I know many of you in this room. So super happy to be here. And I want to start with this, my Massachusetts roots. Um, yes. Okay. This is a picture of Massachusetts of uh, Worcester City Hall, because I was born and raised in Worcester. And I want to give a shout out. Where is the Zoom camera? I don't know if I'm looking into it, but my 90-year-old dad is watching this presentation in Worcester. He's my biggest fan. Hello, dad. And my sister and my brother and my whole family is still in Worcester. I chose this picture of Worcester City Hall to share that with you, um, which came from an NPR story with this headline. Forget Oakland and Hoboken, Worcester is the new it city. Well, it was not the it city when I went to high school there and graduated high school, but I'm really glad it is the it city. And um, I think that's one of the reasons I have a special fondness for doing work and presenting in Massachusetts. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? We have a road map, which is why I have a picture here of a road um, leading into Leicester. I always like to have a road of the place where I'm speaking. I also like to share with you um, my visual description is I'm a white woman. Unlike Mary, I just own the gray hair. I own the age. I say my most salient visual feature is my gray hair. Um, and it also represents the fact that I have been in the digital accessibility space since 1995. So... I'm just owning it. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm really glad to be here talking to you about this. So the roadmap, what is digital accessibility? Massachusetts track record of digital accessibility advocacy and success, keys to Massachusetts digital accessibility leadership, and looking to the future. So I know I have 35 minutes. I probably now have 31 minutes, and I have so much I want to share, and I want to be kind to the interpreters. So Let's go. All right, what is accessibility in a digital world, which is such a great title for this gathering today. Digital accessibility is a bridge. That's how I see it. It is many things. I, I so agree with the secretary. I've said many, many times, it's not a checklist. It's many, many things. But at its core, it's a bridge. I have a picture here of the old North Bridge in Concord. Um, and it's a bridge connecting disabled people to technology all people with disabilities and all technology. So it's really important to have a very expansive idea of this. We say, well, first of all, we say digital accessibility. When I started, we talked about web accessibility because the web was kind of the main thing. I really like what Mary said about access to information. When I say technology, I'm meaning the information that the technology delivers as well as the technology itself. Now digital is so much more. We saw some examples from Mass General and its kiosks and its mobile apps and its employee software. And it's pretty much every courseware, learning platforms. Everything we're doing is digital now. So we need a bridge between people with disabilities to be able to access the tools that we are all using every single day. So um, yeah, all people with disabilities, Technology needs to work for everyone and accessibility impacts people who can't see a screen, who can't hear a video, who can't hold a mouse for whatever reason, who have cognitive disabilities. So we're trying to think really broadly of it. And this is one of these issues. We have to hold the broad ideas while we're working on the nitty gritty hard work that takes that takes to get 
to get it done. So another example of the bridge digital accessibility is also privacy and security for disabled people. If there is no accessibility, disabled people need help. They break security and privacy. So if you're someone who cares about privacy and security, you work in an organization that does, you have to care about accessibility. Disability, like we already heard this morning, is essential to diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging, really for two reasons. One, because people with disabilities are people that are part of the disability, equity, inclusion, belonging community, and disability is cross-cutting. Black people are disabled. Asian people are disabled. That's why I think it's LGBT people disabled. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons I do, when I do the visual introduction of myself, I always say I'm a white woman, so we're not defaulting. And when I have pictures, I'll, I'll say the race of the people in the pictures because disability isn't just a white thing. So at the diversity, equity, and inclusion table, there are people with disabilities plus disability as its own category. So if you care about these things, you have to care about accessibility. And disability, digital accessibility is a civil right. That really has been the core of my career. As you know, I'm a lawyer. Digital accessibility is a civil right. The bridge I use for this is a bridge in my hometown of Worcester at Elm Park, because it was so pretty. It's like this pink bridge that goes over a little stream. Why do we say digital accessibility is a civil right? because digital accessibility is about exclusion and inclusion. It really boils down to that. When people say, oh, it's too complicated, we know what, don't know what to do, why should we do it? So this is a picture of a very locked door with a double bolt and a, key, a chain, and it's old, looks like it hasn't been opened for decades. And that's what it's like when things aren't accessible. People with disabilities are excluded. You don't design for people who use screen readers, people are excluded. You don't have captions and sign language interpreters, people are excluded. If you have to use a mouse to get somewhere, people are excluded. So it's a civil right because we have a right to inclusion. So in contrast to this locked door, I have this nice picture of an open door with the sun shining through because that is what we're going for. We're going for full inclusion with the sun shining through. Um, so Second on, the, second on the roadmap, Massachusetts has a track record of digital accessibility, advocacy, and success. You know, I'm going to stop here and just say, I forgot to set the timer when I started, so maybe someone here, give me a, a waved hand when I have five minutes left, just so I, I know we have a packed agenda. Um, okay, so the track record. I started my work in digital accessibility in the mid 90s in California, where I left Worcester to move to Berkeley, California, where I have been ever since. Sorry, dad. Sorry, sister. Um, and while I was there, I was working at Disability Rights Education Defense Fund. Blind people came to us a few years after the ADA passed, said, there's not a single ATM in the whole country that we can use. And Talk about a privacy issue, blind people had to share their PIN in order to get their own money out of an ATM. So we wrote letters to major banks and we said, you wanna sit down and talk to us about this? Cause there were no ATMs anywhere. And we didn't wanna file a lawsuit. Mostly I was scared to file a lawsuit and screw up the ADA for you know the future. Fast forward, we put together a great group of blind people and organizations. And we worked with the major banks in California to get talking ATMs, and then we got the first website agreement in 2000 with Bank America, who's since been a leader. And when that was done, you know, my work, the collaborative way I practice law is called Structured Negotiation. And the name of my book is Structured Negotiation, a Winning Alternative to Lawsuits. Um, when we finished with the banks, we didn't have that name. We had just done something to get a result. We said, hmm, maybe we could do this somewhere else. Maybe we should call it something and try it somewhere else to see if it was just luck or maybe it's replicable. So we called it structured negotiation. And the first place I wanted to do it was Massachusetts, probably because I'm from Worcester. So we called the Disability Law Center in Massachusetts. Someone told me, you got to talk to Chris Griffin. She was the executive director at the time. We called Chris Griffin. She said, sure, we want to work on talking ATMs. We want to bring them to Massachusetts. We want accessible websites here. So working with Disability Law Center, I put their logo up here. We 
got an amazing group of blind people in Massachusetts, Bay State Council of the Blind. We did the same thing we did in California. We tried this new thing, which now is called structured negotiation, and wrote a letter to the banks. And at the end of the day, we had Fleet, Sovereign Bank, and Citizens. Right here in Massachusetts, Fleet was the first bank outside of California to have talking ATMs. They were the second bank in the country to have an accessible website. And all these banks, sovereign citizens did that. So not only was that great advocacy in Massachusetts, but it kind of, I would say, helped launch this collaborative legal process because it showed this work somewhere else. And then we went on to do other things. Um, but it wasn't only bank websites at Massachusetts was first on and was early on. Um, other accessible website achievements that are part of your history. And I mean, part of the reason I wanted to do this talk this way is like history, we need that now. We need to know our history because that's the foundation that we're building on as we do all the new stuff that we have to do. Because, you know, it's already been said up here on the stage, we're far from done here. And there, this is a journey. So. Um, Monster and Peapod were two very important web accessibility cases that the National Federation of the Blind of Massachusetts did with the Attorney General's office. And it was really groundbreaking at the time to have an Attorney General. I think it started with Martha Coakley and then it went, I, I think the Peapod one was done with your next governor, Maura Healy. Um, and, but it was the collaboration between the advocacy group and the community got those two agreements. And then I helped work on Major League Baseball accessibility, which I put a picture of the Red Sox logo here because without Brian Charlson and other blind Red Sox fans, there would not be accessibility of the Major League Baseball website and mobile apps. Why? Because that was a case of collaboration with a big C. As a lawyer, really all I did was kind of make the introduction between the Major League Baseball executives and the blind baseball fans and it was like light bulbs so you have a history here that you can build on which is at its core people with disabilities have to be involved at every single stage of this not brought in at the end as testers as designers as developers as before it's designed as thinkers of the idea and that's really what happened with major league baseball massachusetts was a leader in point of sale accessibility in the mid 2000s, all of a sudden the retail industry decided that we didn't need keypads when we checked out, we just needed flat screens. Again, privacy issue, blind people had to share their pin because they couldn't enter it on a flat screen. This is a picture of Brian Charlson, again, having people with disabilities involved in the efforts um, was really critical. We did many, many cases, but the Massachusetts ones were staples and CVS, we did testing, that's what this picture is. Healthcare digital access, we already heard some this morning of some of the ideas. Um, all of this stuff is so rich. You know, I've done whole talks on healthcare accessibility and how it happens. But what I wanna highlight for Massachusetts, because you have the roots, you have the foundation, you have the successful advocacy. One is Mass General and the case and structured negotiation that Greater Boston Legal Services and BCIL did. Um, and it was in structured negotiation and Dan Manning, I need to give a shout out to Dan because he was the first lawyer in the country to call me up and said, what is this structured negotiation? Could you teach me how to do it? And the collaboration with Mass General at the time was great. Mass Eye and Ear, um, we heard about a new thing that they're doing. They worked with the Community-Based State Council of the Blind on accessibility. Accessible Medical Records, the Massachusetts Association of the Blind and Visually Impaired, led by Sassy Outwater, is doing work with medical records companies to make sure that if a person with a disability goes into a medical setting, it is known if they want to disclose, it's a privacy thing, what the accommodations are needed, what the, what the accessibility needs are. Accessible prescription information has been a big part of my work for many years. None of it would have been possible without Kim Charlson, uh, who I think is listening. I don't know if that's the camera. I think that's the light. So I, don't, I think the camera's over there. So maybe the people on Zoom, I apologize if I'm not looking at you instead I'm looking up at the ceiling. Um, but we work with many major pharmacies and CVS most recently, right in their mainstream app, you can, get your medication with a chip on it, 
use your own iPhone, your own mainstream app. You don't have to go to anything separate and read what's on the label with the app. So if you haven't checked that out, I really recommend it. Um, and again, that has its roots in Massachusetts advocacy. And then the last one to share is healthcare kiosks, which was another great effort of the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office and National Federation of the Blind. Um, again, these are all, all the healthcare stuff is so often when I talk about these issues, I start with healthcare because it's so easy to see the privacy issues in healthcare and the need to keep the information confidential. So you go into a retail and you can use a machine that will read your blood pressure, give you critical health information. If it's not accessible, people with disabilities can't use it. So these are just some of the things that Massachusetts has a history of. Um, audio description and captions and media access. Another Massachusetts success story, really, um, Netflix, Hulu, and HBO Max worked, worked with Bay State Council of the Blind, some in structure negotiations, some in lawsuits to have audio description. And of course, Massachusetts, the home of NCAM GBH, which I just learned today from Brian, the director who's here. Um, there's no more WGBH as it was when I lived in Massachusetts. Now it's GBH. Um, and I put the picture of the ADP, the audio description project, which I really like this just this logo they have, it's AD and there's a radio signal coming off the D and then the P and then the braille letters for A, D and P below it. Voting access, Massachusetts is a real leader in accessible voting. I chose a picture of the whole country in yellow, you can't distinguish states and then Massachusetts is popping bright pink because it really reflected what I just wanted to share really quickly. Again, we could do a whole talk on that. The incredible work the advocates you all have done in Massachusetts to do lawsuits, leveraging those lawsuits, getting accessibility in voting, which again is a COVID, it's COVID related because people didn't want to go to the polls. So there was more development of online voting information and absentee ballots and mail-in ballots. And you have the Landmark Votes Act. I'm not an expert in voting. So I asked several people like, is Massachusetts really as standout as it looks? And everyone confirmed, yes, it is. So. Um, education access, also much leadership in Massachusetts. I illustrated this with a picture of a smiling black student um, using sign language. Couple of examples early, the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office and NFB Massachusetts did a case with Apple over iTunes U. Actually, I put this in education, it could be in entertainment. They also did the iTunes store, but you know, really early on, it was like 2014, understanding that people with disabilities need access to the content on iTunes U. There was a collaboration with Bay State Council to get the Common App accessible so high school students in Massachusetts can apply to college on equal footing. Harvard and MIT um, had a lawsuit about captioning and the result of that was a settlement. I mean, my practice is to try to settle first and never have to go to court, but the civil rights demands the right to file lawsuits. Lawsuits are very important, ethical lawsuits particularly. So the Harvard and MIT started as a lawsuit, but did result in a settlement, which really is a roadmap for higher ed captioning and best practices. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. And also Harvard, um, they didn't just sign a lawsuit and walk away. You know, it's not like the secretary said, a checklist. They have an amazing accessibility commitment right now. And um, I put on this slide, Harvard accessibility commitment. I wrote accessibility as A11Y, which we use as a shortcut for accessibility because there's 11 letters between the A and the Y. Um, because Harvard is recognizing under the leadership of Kyle Schumach and Eric Manser, who gave me this information and their incredible team that accessibility takes culture and technology. It's not just technology. There's so much about culture, just technology you end up in the checklist boat. So I really recommend Harvard is really on their procurement, what they're doing for higher ed, they're really a national model. So, um, and then government services and operation. We've heard a little bit about that. Um, the unemployment insurance digital overhaul that the state is doing has involved people with disabilities in a very deep way with the advisory committee and Greater Boston Legal Services is doing great work on the procurement. I helped a little bit on the back end and could see just 
really, I hope somebody writes this up as a case study. I really encourage you to like call the Harvard Business School and don't they do case studies and say, you should write this up, what, what's happening with that to make sure it's accessible advisory group with disabled people and our hosts and be all end all of this summit, the Massachusetts Office on Disability doing amazing things. Um, Julia's gonna have a whole talk on this later. So I just put two things on the slide along with the seal, the collaboration that was already mentioned with the EOTSS, which I won't, I didn't even try to remember, but I did spell it out for accessibility reasons, Executive Office of Technology Services and Security, amazing collaboration there. And also the cross government team that Mary mentioned on governance the cross team in the United States, in the in the whole state. So, um, and then there's the accessibility community. Accessibility Boston is Boston's digital accessibility and user experience group. Anyone can join who's, it's open to anyone interested in digital accessibility, has meetups and conferences and was founded by Sarah Bourne, whose picture I put on the slide, who's sitting in the front row and is gonna get mods award this afternoon. Um, so yeah, so you know that's just some of the foundation on which you can stand and sit and be as you move forward to the future. So I've pulled out a few um, a few keys. Like what what is what is all this stuff about? Like what what kind of lessons can we learn from your great history to move forward to the future? So what are the keys to the digital accessibility leadership? And I really think you should feel that way. I'm not just saying this, like if someone invited me to go speak in Vermont or Iowa, I wouldn't be able to do a talk like this. It's really, I just want to say that's very authentic. I didn't like, you know. Um, okay, so centering people with disabilities. That is one of the key strands of all the success that you all had. People with disabilities, like I said, in the room, at the table, as decision makers, with input, with accountability, intersectionality. I illustrated this with a picture from a uh, stock photo site called Disabled in Here, and it shows four black women, one's in a wheelchair, one's using a cane, sitting around an office setting. I have a post on my website. If you look, my website is lflegal.com, and I have a post on disability diverse stock photo sites. So if you publish anything or you do talks, I have a list of sites that are free, a list of sites that you have to pay for. And like everything else in our work, it takes just a little bit of intention to bring the issue of diversity and accessibility married into one. Um, collaboration. So many people have said collaboration this morning already. I don't have to sell you on the value of it, but all the successes I saw, so much collaboration between individual people with disabilities, the nonprofit organizations that you're so rich with here, the state agencies and the functions within the agencies, the corporate sector, higher ed, and expertise. You know, you have Perkins here, you have the Carroll Center, you have NCAM, which we mentioned. What a rich source. That has been something that has helped me throughout my career, relying on these agencies, even for cases not, or work I do consulting, not in Massachusetts. So you're really blessed with this very rich group in all these sectors that you can collaborate with. And it was exciting to hear already in the remarks that the collaboration has gone on. And I know from my work in structure negotiation in Massachusetts, it's all about collaboration. So um, no silos. This is my picture. I don't know if it's a picture of Massachusetts barns. It's really old school white and red barns. And I put a big red X on it because digital accessibility doesn't work if you stay in your silo. It has to be, the word cross should be in front of everything. Cross agency, you know, cross campus. If you're doing something for students, think about employees, you know, think about staff. If you're doing something for baseball fans, think about the people coding the baseball website. People with disabilities aren't just consumers of information on tech, they're builders, they're creators. We need everything to be accessible from the creation side all the way to the end user side. So silos, no, big red X on that. Um, celebration. I am a big believer in celebrating successes in accessibility, no matter how small. 
Also, big celebrations. I put a picture of Perkins in here because when Fleet announced the first ATMs in Massachusetts, Perkins, we had like a whole big press conference. It was covered in, in you know, the media. Marla Runyon, who's now at Fidelity, was at the height of her Paralympic success, and she was there as a speaker. Mass General, when the BCIL Mass General Settlement, I don't know if you guys remember that or know it, they had like a big picnic on the grounds of Mass General. And, you know, Dan Manning from Greater Boston Legal Services, he said, that wouldn't happen in a lawsuit. You know, that wouldn't happen without collaboration because another word I don't have here, which I should have put in, is relationship. It's been my experience over 27 years that accessibility works when relationships are built because this is not a one and done field because you could have an accessible mobile app and with the next release, you could break accessibility. And if you're blind, you could probably raise your hand right now or raise your hand at home that you have had that experience. Something works and then it doesn't work. It's the relationships that make it stick between all the collaborative people. So the other point coming out of all the Massachusetts stuff I looked at, ethics. You know, I like everything, there are people who do things with ethics and there are people who do things without ethics. And in the accessibility space right now, we have some unethical things going on. But all of everything I saw in Massachusetts was so ethical. And the reason I talked about ethics is privacy and security as being part of ethics. I use this image with a bunch of blue locks, but one red lock is unopened. Five minutes, okay. Um, Thank you. Ethical legal strategies, implementation. You don't, for legal stuff, you don't write a settlement agreement and then it's done. You have to stick with it. You have to implement. And that's what I've seen Massachusetts, your history you can build on. And no shortcuts. Um, I invite you to look at the overlayfactsheet.com if you're wondering about what is a shortcut in accessibility. Um, that is one. And that hasn't happened in what I've seen in Massachusetts, which is why it was so easy to put together a talk highlighting your successes. Um, Massachusetts advocacy understands the accessibility cookie. I'm just going to really quickly let you know the accessibility cookie is the idea that it takes not just collaboration from the different sectors that we talked about, but many, many roles in an organization. It's not the developers who make it happen. So the picture here is of cookies that were actually baked for a talk I did in New Zealand about the accessibility cookie. And I said, just bake something with, they said, can we do anything? I said, just have somebody bake something with tons of ingredients. You know, so these cookies, chocolate chips and coconut and M&Ms and flour, sugar, you know, hiring disabled people is job number one if you wanna work on accessibility, because if there's a deaf person in the cubicle next door, less likely the other person who's not deaf is gonna send out a video without captions. Hiring disabled people, being transparent, testing, training, ethics, design, development, procurement, procurement's so key. There's not an organization that doesn't bring in technology. So you could be the, you could feel your programs are all really good, but if you're not working with your procurement people to make sure that what you bring in is accessible, you're gonna break accessibility each and every time. So contract language is a whole, many things you can do to ensure that um, and collaboration and the people of Massachusetts. That is really the biggest kind of key that I saw in all this that across all those sectors, it's all you guys who have created this environment. So I want to just talk about looking to the future because I don't want you all to think, oh, every, Lainey thinks everything's perfect. Rose colored glasses. Look at all these past successes. No, I know, you know, even with the gray hair, I'm not ready to retire yet because there's still so much left to do, you know? So I think you have so much strength here to carry it into the future with all the things to do. So some of the future things, accessibility is a journey, as I show in this Massachusetts road going to the Mass Pike and to Worcester. Um, emerging issues, healthcare and employment. You know what? We need a new word besides emerging because things aren't emerging. They're here now. We have to be now. We can't think of them. So I had this image with the Mass General people already covered about uh, doctor appearing on a screen in a hospital room without captions and sign language not accessible. So, so much is happening in healthcare. 
in employment, so much is happening. The Department of Justice and the EEOC two months ago put out guidance warning employers that hiring tools that use AI, you know, resume scanners and interview things have so much potential to discriminate against people with disabilities if not built with accessibility and designed with accessibility from the beginning. So we need all the things that we've talked about here this morning, the collaboration and the celebration and the hard work and the all of it to deal with these things in the future. Access to justice is going digital. I don't know what's happening in Massachusetts, but many, many courts, those of you involved in that space, really need to look carefully because court systems are not just information, but actual arbitrations, decision-making, court hearings, that's going digital. So talk about a closed door, locking people out. Um, that has to be all your skills and all the power of your Massachusetts advocacy needs to focus on that. Education and more. Fortunately, there's a lot of resources for ex uh, extended reality, virtual reality, meta. So I just put a few here. There's an organization called XR Access. There is PEAT, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. So there are there's the Accessible VR Virtual Reality Meetup. People are working on these issues, so you don't have to start from scratch with anything you don't know. Um, so that's it. That's it. Stay in touch. My final slide has a picture of my book, um, Structured Negotiation and Winning Alternative to Lawsuits. Really want to thank Mary and Julia and the whole team and all of you for inviting me here and have a great rest of summit. Thank you, Mary. Oh, I, for I forgot the request, which you did tell me in advance, but I'm not sure I remember what they are. So, so thank you so much, Lainey. Um, we do have a few questions for you that were submitted um, in advance by guests prior to the event. Uh, so the first question, if you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> right. Uh, what is the current status of new state or federal legislation or official standards that require electronic and information technology to be accessible to people with disabilities and how imminent is it? So what is, you know, so what are sort of- Yes, I got it. Emerging yes. laws and regulations? That is a really good question and timely. So I came to Boston yesterday after being in DC at a conference called M Enabling, which is focused on digital accessibility. And my job there was to do a fireside chat asking questions of Rebecca Bond, who runs the disability rights section at the Department of Justice. So I phew to the first question because I feel I'm kind of up on it. So um, one big thing that you may have heard of is Senator Tammy Duckworth and Representative John Sarbanes introduced legislation last month in September called the Web Accessibility and Software Applications Act. Web Accessibility and Software Applications Act. On my website, lflegal.com, I have a legal update tab. When big things happen, I try to write about them. So the most recent article I have up there is all about that law. It's proposed. So I think the last part of that question, how imminent is it? You know how federal legislation works. Um, best thing about that legislation, there are many, many good things, but in terms of the theme of collaboration we have today, up on the stage at M Enabling was the American Council of the Blind, the National Federation of the Blind, the American Foundation of the Blind, National Disability Rights Network, and then there's another list of 25 organizations. So the disability community is solidly behind this bill. There have been other bills introduced in 19 and 20, which I've also written about that were not good. You have to be really careful because the ones in 2019 and, or 20 and 21 were the Online Accessibility Act. So sounds good, looks good. But in fact, it wasn't. So there's that. And then the other big thing is that the Justice Department has said that next April, they are going to, parentheses, finally, they didn't say finally, issue regulations for Title II, which is state and local government. In 2010, they said they were going to issue regulations. <laughs> in 2010, many of us, probably many of us in this room, wrote comments and feedback and testified nothing happened. So I don't know. I can't really answer. And it's not only for state and local government. Title III is business. And there's nothing even on the table about that. 
Thank you, Lainey. Um, we've recently seen several so-called drive-by lawsuits related to digital accessibility. Can you explain what those are and what role they might play in accessibility compliance efforts? You all need to know I do entire talks on these very <laughs> topics, so I'll give you a snapshot. That's kind of what I was getting, at, one big piece of what I was getting at about ethics. So an ethical lawsuit is one, in my view, and I've written about this on my website too, where a person with a disability encounters a problem, tries to get it fixed, doesn't get a response, goes to a lawyer, the lawyer writes a letter, doesn't get it fixed, files a lawsuit. Now, you don't have to go through all those steps. You can have an ethical lawsuit without it. Something could be urgent. Somebody's about to go into a hospital and they don't have a sign language interpreter. There's been cases pregnant women don't have a, who are deaf, don't have a sign language. Obviously, no time for talking to anyone. You got to do the lawsuit. The drive-by lawsuits are, they started in 2017. You'll see numbers like 4,000 lawsuits filed in the US last year, probably three web accessibility lawsuits, probably 3,920 of them are by lawyers who, you know, I know we're short on time, but it's hard to talk about this because they are going after websites that may not be perfect. So there is a school of thought that it raises attention. But in my view, overall, I'm opposed to them because I think they hurt people with disabilities. They make people with disabilities seem like they're greedy and they don't wanna talk. They really don't want solution. They just want money. And they're handled by lawyers who in my view are not civil rights lawyers. They found a field that it was easy to run a scan, find a violation of a standard, file a lawsuit. It's very interesting in the proposed law that Senator Duckworth introduced, it specifically says in there that you could be off one WCAG, which is a standard one checkpoint, and you might still have a website that people can use. And so it specifically says in that proposed law, we don't want that to be a civil rights violation. A civil rights violation should be something, you know, that you can explain to a five-year-old why the door is locked and why we need to open the door. So it is a thing. Some people feel that it raises attention. Attention is certainly raised, but I have to say, sometimes attention is raised to the checklist. Oh, we got a lawsuit. We better do a checklist. We better find some quick solution. So where I stand, I don't like them. All right. Sorry, I couldn't <laughs> say that any quicker. We've got one more question um, and feel free to take your time with it. <laughs> Many bank ATM machines now have voice output for blind or visually impaired people. Can you provide more insight on the current landscape of self-checkout accessibility? Uh, what's required, when, when it's required, when it isn't required, and what's keeping these self-checkout kiosks from being fully accessible now? That is a great question. When I mentioned we worked on point of sale, we specifically, even then, it, it was like 2005, we said at staffed locations, because we knew we weren't getting accessibility with those point of sale devices. We were getting independent access to PIN. We're getting the right for people to independently enter their PIN. Unfortunately, there was a very good case that was filed against a retailer when two blind people went into a store and the person who was supposed to help them with the self-check actually robbed them. And what could be a better set of facts? Unfortunately, the judge found that there weren't, I don't know, I, I don't exactly, it was like three years ago, there weren't the right standards. We need to fix that. That is something needs to be fixed. The access board, which some of you may be familiar with because they do architectural standards, they have an NPRM, a notice of proposed rulemaking out about self-service checkout, not just checkout, self-service kiosks, all sorts of kiosks. So that would be great if they want to address it. But if you search my website, I have a lot written about kiosks and I keep track of the law. You can find a legal one. In 2010, there was a proposed regulation and I have on my website all the comments I wrote for 2010 and many of us in the community wrote. So we, 
I've come to believe there's something a little broken about the regulatory system. It, 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 it doesn't, not speaking of what happens in Massachusetts, but federally, it just isn't keeping up. You know, the technology is happening so fast, which is why the collaboration, the working with people with disabilities, the understanding the privacy implications, we have to do that because the law is kind of lagging behind a little bit. I mean, the law is very strong, don't get me wrong. And in the legal update tab, you can read about the cases and all the stuff, but the regulations are a problem. And I think that question or got to one place where it is a big problem. Thank you so much, Lainey. That is all the time we have right now. Um, thank you. I want to thank the interpreter because I know I talk fast. <laughs> and I... All right, thank you all. Let's give a round to Lainey as well. Thank you so much. Um, I'd now like to welcome my colleague, Jeff Dugan, MOD's Assistant Director for Community Services, to come up to the stage. So I'm going to be honest, it's been a while since I've been in front of people doing public speaking like this. I do a lot of trainings yearly uh, over virtual for this time during the pandemic. So if I'm screaming into the microphone, please let me know uh, as I reacclimate myself to in-person uh, presentations. So I'm really happy and thank you, Julie, uh, Julia. And as Lainey had shared with us, oops, sorry, thank you. Oh, hey, that's much better. Thank you. Um, see, now I don't have to scream. Um, so as Lainey shared with us, uh, successful accessibility requires collaboration and engagement on the local level. Uh, MOD is proud to support Massachusetts uh, cities and towns through our municipal ADA improvement grant program. This grant program supports capital improvements specifically dedicated to improving accessibility for persons with disabilities. Um, one of our grant winners from the FY22 cycle uh, is here with us today and it was the town of Arlington. Uh, and I'm really excited to introduce Arlington here. They had a really creative project. Uh, the selection team that reviewed their application uh, and it thought that they found a unique and effective way of making their meetings accessible. So their, their application was very uh, in depth with uh, accessible technology so that they could hold these meetings during the pandemic that were accessible to, uh, to everybody participating in those meetings. And they used our grant program to help fund uh, some of the technology for that. Um, so I want to uh, introduce, and uh, I know I had a late minute change, but I want to introduce Jim Feeney, who's the deputy town manager, to discuss their grant. And then after that, we'll introduce Paul uh, Paravano, who is the, uh, uh, the co-chair of the Commission on Disabilities, who will we'll discuss it, and Tim Ross, who is also the ADA coordinator. So if I can invite Jim Feeney, the deputy uh, town manager up, uh, I'll give you the floor. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you uh, on behalf of Arlington to MOD for uh, the grant that allowed us to pursue uh, certain technologies that Jeff alluded to that uh, would allow us to establish a few conference rooms in popular uh, town buildings to host uh, hybrid meetings. So there's obviously a desire like we're doing today to you know bring folks together in person, but also still provide opportunities for those who may not be able to join in person to still essentially have a seat at the table. So we uh, use the grant to uh, research and purchase and install uh, Zoom optimized equipment from a company called Neat in a few of our uh, public conference rooms. Again, we used the grant opportunity in a unique way, essentially to bypass some of the architectural or physical uh, barriers to entry that are experienced in some of our older historic buildings and thought, well, you know, we can do better. So uh, again, we're appreciative for the opportunity. I know we don't have much time, but we've in partnership with our local disability commission, uh, co-chaired by Paul Paravano, 
are starting to embark on this journey. You know, we're, we're not perfect yet, but committed to providing all of our residents more opportunities to engage civically with the, you know, we have nearly 70 uh, boards, committees, and commissions discussing uh, on a regular basis a number of different topics. So we're hopeful that this will sort of allow for increased engagement locally. So I'd like to invite up Paul. Good morning, everyone. Everybody hear me okay? Yes, good morning. Uh, so yes, I am Paul Paravano. I work at MIT. I do government relations for MIT. I've been there for 32 years. And I want to start by saying I'm glad to be alive, active, and working at a time when people like Laney Feingold are in our community. Ain't that the truth? And I know we don't have uh, uh, time, but I need to say that I met Lainey uh, a number of years ago at a time when I confronted that locked door, the picture she showed um, of the door with chains, double lock. I called American Express and asked for my statements in Braille, something which many banks were already doing, and got a very firm no. So I called Lainey. And for the next two years, Lainey and her partner, her legal partner, and I and another client uh, met once a month with American Express under the structured negotiation approach. And now at my house, the Braille statement from American Express comes before the print statement does. That's the kind of work that Lainey Feingold does. I'm hoping her book is being sold here. I don't know if we arrange that or not, but get that book, Structured Negotiation. It's really terrific. Um, thank you, Jim, for the introduction and for the collaboration. I, I want to just take two minutes and say that, yes, we have a commission in Arlington, as many other communities do in uh, Massachusetts. We're active. We meet monthly. Our members are uh, nominated by the town manager and approved by the select board. We think of ourselves as watchdogs, as advocates to promote and push the kind of work that we've been hearing about all morning. At the state level, the Massachusetts Office on Disability works to highlight this kind of work. And I'm so grateful to them for the grant, of course, but also for keeping the pressure on and for keeping a reminder for uh, cabinet officers, as we heard earlier, um, for their work and reminding us all what are the responsibilities uh, to make sure that these issues and the needs of, of uh, disabled persons about communicating on technology, what technologies are available. There are many areas that still need a lot of work. Our commission thinks about voting, transportation, recreation, building access issues. Um, uh, a whole range of things. And I know, for example, voting is one thing that I, as a commission member, am, am extremely interested in. And for those who still value, I'm sort of old fashioned in this way, I like going to the polls and we haven't be able, been able to do that as easily during the pandemic. And I understand that. And I fully embrace the uh, concepts of accessible voting by mail and other approaches. But the equipment, the uh, equipment that many towns still have for voting, the uh, uh, automark machines are getting old and don't work all the time. Those are the kinds of things that we need to help each other, remind each other that the Secretary of State's office um, needs to help us with to either replace those or find new technology. These are the kinds of things that I think Lady was talking about, that there is um, an effort 
to learn about new technology. And, you know, we at MIT care a lot about that technology. I noticed that she said that Harvard was out ahead on that settlement uh, of the lawsuit. I didn't hear a mention of MIT and that hurts, but she's right. <laughs> she's absolutely right. So we, we all need to be involved in that. And our commission is lucky to have active members, but collaborative people like Jim Feeney uh, and others. We try to meet with the heads of other departments of public works, people who are in charge of clearing snow and keeping sidewalks safe and folks who think about audible signals and the technology that's there. That's our job. We uh, value the fact that we have this collaboration and cooperation with the town and the opportunity to, to work with each other to make sure that we have the latest technology and that we make opportunities available, as Jim said, for people who cannot attend in-person meetings. That's what this equipment will be very useful for uh, because we've learned a lot during the pandemic about the fact that Zoom does work, other platform, pl platforms do work, and we need to uh, maximize the opportunity for those who aren't as mobile and can't always get to the many meetings that a town like Arlington has so that people can give uh, their input. One of our... Um, Great moments came recently when we uh, hired a uh, ADA coordinator. So I want to ask Tim Ross, who is our new ADA coordinator, uh, hired just a couple of months ago, to help us move along uh, this level of collaboration uh, in our town. So thank you very much. And here's Tim. Hi everyone, uh, Tim Ross, I'm the new ADA coordinator for the town of Arlington. Uh, only been there for about two months, um, but I think one of the, the best parts has been the level of excitement, uh, really putting accessibility at the forefront. Um, you know, whether I'm meeting with DPW, Parks and Rec, um, everyone has just been so excited to kind of have accessibility be um, the highlight of what they're wor working on. Um, and with the grant, with the te technology, we'll be starting a pilot program uh, next month. And I think, you know, one of the running themes that we've talked about here today, uh, not just to have that checkbox of having the equipment, but really to, to push it to its limits, uh, find what works for us and really improve it for everyone. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having us today. So thank you, Arlington, really. And I'm really excited about the work that you did in the application that you gave. And I was, it was really proud to, to have funded you for that project. Uh, and you did a great job implementing it. So, so thank you. And we look forward to uh, awarding the FY23 grants uh, soon as well. Uh, that cycle closed. We're in the currently reviewing them. So if you're a community who may have applied, we haven't announced anything yet, I promise. Uh, but we're, we're looking at all of the applications now and making decisions uh, with the selection committee. So with that, I really... Uh, Accessibility starts at the local level, and no one really knew this better than the late advocate Tom Hopkins. And it's my pleasure to kind of segment this to the video that was produced. Um, I knew Tom for a long time when I started at MOD. Uh, he was my mentor. He, he really taught me a lot about building codes as the uh, not only the compliance officer for the uh, Architectural Access Board in Massachusetts, but also as the executive director of that agency. And I used to go to him to understand some of the nuances of the building code. And without his insight, without his way of explaining those things to me, I don't know if I'd be where I am uh, today. His insight, his, his understanding, and his patience with me, and I'm sure a lot of other people throughout the Commonwealth who he helped, um, really, uh, he really made a difference in a lot of people's different in, in lives. So, and I would assume that many of you here today were also touched by Tom's advocacy and mentorship, or you may know him as a skilled woodworker, uh, a devoted husband, a father, and a grandfather. Uh, and in 2015, MOD awarded Tom with the first ever Thomas P. Hopkins Disability Access Award. Tom was an advocate to his core. Um, as someone who used a wheelchair, uh, Tom got his start with advocacy in Michigan, where he connected with a group of advocates to create 
an access guide for Lansing. Uh, when the ADA passed in 1990, Tom eagerly studied that new law. And, uh, and he, when he started to look around and noticing all of the discrepancies of what the law actually requires, and what was actually built around him, he found a lot of issues and concerns. And so Tom sprung into action as he always and often would do. And he connected with, our, with the Mass Office on Disability and through trainings and things like that of access surveys about building codes and regulations. Uh, and armed with his new knowledge and I think three tools, a, a level, a tape measure and a door pressure gauge, uh, Tom's advocacy grew stronger. He realized that in order to really enforce laws, sometimes you need to file a federal lawsuit. And he did. Please enjoy the short video honoring Tom's life and impact before, during, and in the aftermath of that lawsuit. Thank you. When this video starts, a split screen shows the film at left and an ASL interpreter at right. Captions below provide a text version of every. When this video starts, a split screen shows the film at left and an ASL interpreter at right. Captions below provide a text version of everything spoken. At a ceremony, MCB Commissioner David Darcangelo presents an award to a man in a wheelchair. Tom has been there every step of the way to answer any and all questions. And you're such a resource. And I know so many people in this room value your leadership that you've given over the years. And I would assert that you have probably made more things accessible for more persons with disabilities than maybe anybody else in the Commonwealth. Over footage of a quaint New England town, text reads, Tom Hopkins, 1954 to 2019. Tom's son, Damon, speaks. In all the years I was a kid in these schools, my father never once got to ever come to any of my events. He never got to come to any of my concerts, anything, because he couldn't get into the building. I, as a kid, you don't understand that. Tom's wife, Linda, he realized the ADA is a civil rights law. It can only be enforced by a federal suit. Text, Tom decided to sue the town of Spencer for their failure to implement their obligations under the ADA. So the suit started. And it was long, drawn out, painful. We knew that it affected both of our, our boys, but we also both knew that it was necessary. It was important. Tom's son, Justin. Oh, it definitely made me a better person, able to get through just about anything, because no excuses, he certainly did. <laughs> Linda. He started investing, writing letters, and starting to build his case for federal court. You know, the, the hardest years were really running from 94 to 96 were the roughest years for us during all of this. You know, that was right at the my high school graduation and Justin going into high school and all these sort of transitions, and it was just a really difficult time. Oh, it always got worse. <laughs> it always got worse. I mean, between them threatening to burn us out of this building and you know, there was the FBI here for a while, you know, and I, I used to have a police escort at times, you know, because it was... He shrugs. It's the way it was. And fights back tears. You know, it's just kind of the way it was. Paul Spooner, Executive Director, Metro West Center for Independent Living. You know, when you get dragged through the mud like that, you either do one or two things. You either give up or you get better at what you do. And Tom got better at what he did. Then he applied for the compliance officer's position at the AAB. It was like a job made just for Tom. And one of the areas Tom had great impact was ensuring access to compliance with historical buildings without taking away the historical nature of the building. So we're all tabs. If, if you're not disabled now, you're temporarily able-bodied. He had these guys who would go out and help him do a site visit, and they would keep notes and take pictures, and he was teaching all these people how to do what he was doing. And, and I sort of saw a change in him because then it was he wasn't alone. Kate Sutton. He was a tough guy. 
but he was never cool. Watery, ADA compliance. He was always did things with intention and purpose and would even like back up and explain things for people if they weren't quite getting it. Patricia Mendez. I try to take in, I try to uh, ask him questions. And now, after years, when I have like hard, hard questions to think about, I, I do think, okay, what would Tom say? How would he approach it? Jeffrey L. Dugan. He was a, a resource that I went to very frequently to talk about, you know, the codes and from that a friendship really developed. I think that just those road trips that we did together were like, are my favorite memories. Uh, me and my younger brother both. Uh, I'm in me an immeasurable amount of tolerance and patience and things and understanding for, you know, things around us that we can't control. People, places, and things you cannot control. That's what my father used to always say to us. And you can only control your reaction to them. And every bit of it's worth it. Definitely taught us to be pretty strong and doing what's right. And, uh, no regrets. Justin <laughs> swallows hard. Text. After several years, Tom and the town settled the lawsuit. He donated the money back to the town to fund accessibility improvements. Before I close today, I wanted to mention a few people. At the awards ceremony. My family, obviously, has been very supportive. They're not here today because we just had uh, two more grandchildren, uh, twin daughters, on Saturday night. That's all. Family photos fill a wall. Commissioner Dark Angelo. Thank you, Tom. Very well deserved. We appreciate your leadership on AAB and thank you for your advocacy. A quote from Tom Hopkins. No act of kindness, no matter how small, is ever wasted. In memory of Tom Hopkins, 1954 to 2019, Mary Margaret Moore, 1948 to 2022, Paul Spooner, 1955 to 2022. Fade to black. This is Mary Mahan McCauley again, and I just wanted to say that I never had the pleasure to meet this man, and I have been active with the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board with Jeff, who's really my, my info man uh, regarding access in the built environment. Um, but everything I hear about Tom is, is just wonderful. And, and I was very, I, I, I felt that it was very important that we had put together this video because as time goes by, um, more individuals may not know who he is. And this award was named after him. So the video explains the man, explains the person. And um, before Julia speaks up here, I just want to say that um, I believe his family is here. And if his family could stand for a round of applause. Um, and also at the end of the video, as we heard, um, Paul Spooner, who was one of the gentlemen that was interviewed, who was the executive director of Metro West, right, Independent Living Center, um, passed away shortly after this was filmed. Um, surprising, I believe, to uh, many people. Um, and he's going to be sorely missed. He's definitely um, was and will continue to be a champion in the space of disability rights and access. And also, we, the, we wanted to dedicate the video to Tom, to Paul, and also to Mar Margaret Mary? Mary Margaret Moore. Mary Margaret Moore. I'm sorry. My name is Mary Margaret, too. So um, Mary Margaret Moore, who was one of the previous recipients of the Tom Hopkins Award. Um, as the leaders in the disability community uh, move on to their eternal reward, or like a person in the audience told me today who's married to an actuary. I think it was, go to, was it go to the next place? <laughs> um, um, then, you know, we need new blood. We need young people to move on because 
you know, disability rights or civil rights. So all of you that are in the audience that are on the younger end, keep going forward because there's a lot of fight to be fought. And um, we're now going to bring up Sarah Bourne, who it has been, um, and I, I will save something for Julia to say. Uh, once I'm at the mic, I can't help it, I'm sorry. Um, so I have the Irish gift of gab. Um, but, you know, Sarah is, an, is another person. We're, we're, she, we're giving her this award this year, and there's some specific things that Julia will, will um, speak on regarding Sarah. But I really need to add that I thought she was a wonderful, wonderful um, person to receive this award. And if folks don't know, there's approximately 46,000 people, I think, in the executive office of the state of Massachusetts, nine secretariats and 70 or 80 agencies. And as the term accessibility or digital accessibility came up, in discussions that I've had, um, you know, I began with the state in 89, but 2019 in the fall, I became the executive director of MOD. And over and over and over, I would hear, call Sarah Bourne. It's Sarah Bourne. Sarah Bourne knows. And one person, <laughs> like leading the effort with all of those people. And then we put together an information technology assistive technology team, which will come up a little later as well. And we invited Sarah and found out that she was retiring June 30th. And so I asked, you know, who is replacing Sarah? And it absolutely will not be one person. It's going to be a full team of people. Um, but she's absolutely deserves uh, this award. And Julia. Thank you, Mary. Stand on my tiptoes. Um, so Sarah Bourne really realizes Tom's vision of a more accessible world. When Sarah began working at the Commonwealth um, as the first state webmaster, she worked closely with staff at the Massachusetts Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing and the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind to be sure that newly emerging web could open opportunities for people with disabilities. Much like Tom Hopkins advocated for curb cuts, wheelchair ramps, and widened doorways to make the built environment accessible, Sarah insisted on prioritizing accessibility from the start when laying the Commonwealth's web foundation. Decades before digital accessibility was in many people's vocabulary. Sarah is also a close friend of MOD and of me. Um, for years, she's served as a critical bridge between MOD and the Executive Office of Technology Services and Security, setting the foundation for our collaborative work in digital accessibility. Um, before her retirement, Sarah made a point to loop MOD into all major projects and bring uh, our accessibility concerns to the table. She was always there to listen, to answer our questions, to provide technical advice, and to get user feedback from people with disabilities. On a personal note, she's always also been an excellent mentor to me and to my colleague, my colleague Rob, um, and we're so proud to give her this award today. So come on up, Sarah. Oh, okay. Where's the camera? Right ahead. There you go. Straight ahead. Sorry, it's not about me. Okay. There you go. Hold it together. All right. Oh, this is camera. Oh, exactly. Sarah, it's a great honor to present you today with the 2022 Thomas P. Hopkins Disability Access Award, and to thank you for your contributions to. Uh, access in a digital world. Thank you so much. I have to stand on tiptoes too. <laughs> um, I, I'm actually too embarrassed to actually say anything. Um, I'm just 
it's been a very rewarding line of work to be able to work with people, to um, make people's lives better. Uh, I've met so many wonderful people in the work that I do saying, whoa, <laughs> look at this new flash thing. Can, can you use that, Phil? My, who's my go-to person at Mass Commission for the Blind? He's like, no. It's like, uh-oh. <laughs> um, and, and just being able to be collaborative with people with different disabilities, maybe they had limb differences and couldn't use a mouse, whether it was people with a hearing difficulty and needed captions. It was always an opportunity to learn to see our world in different ways, to understand that not being able to see or not being able to see well doesn't mean that you can't enjoy the beauty of the world. <laughs> um, so that, that's been just so rewarding for me, and it's been my pleasure to try to pass that on to other people to get them excited about being inclusive and thinking inclusively as we offer our services online. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah's work uh, inspired the creation of MOD's Information Technology and Assisted Technology Working Group in collaboration with the Executive Office of Technology Services and Security and the Executive Office of Administration and Finance. I'm going to make this a little smaller too. The working group's goal is to provide is to improve accessibility and consistency in practices uh, with the Commonwealth's IT resources. Members also bring a diversity of subject matter expertise, including information technology, assisted technology, straight procurement, training, I think I saw April earlier, um, and contract law. The IT Working Group has published three guidance documents for state agencies covering best practices for ensuring that accessibility in, in procurement, um, including mandatory contract language for IT resources, and sample bid solicitation questions to ensure accessibility in IT contracts. Um, you should be seeing those up on EATS's website soon. Uh, these documents provide practical, clear guidance for state agencies. Um, beginning with the 2023 fiscal year, the IT AT Working Group will be strategizing on how to proceed with disseminate, disseminating and training uh, Commonwealth staff on how to use these documents. Um, and the goal is to have them become routine in all IT procurements. Um, accessibility in the world of work is critical to making sure that we can effectively serve the residents of Massachusetts. But accessibility is equally important in the world of play and recreation. Dr. Andy Wu, Senior Director of Peer Counseling for the Able Gamers Charity, is here with us to discuss Able Gamers work. This nonprofit organization's mission is to create opportunities that enable play in order to combat social isolation, foster inclusive communities, and improve the quality of life of people with disabilities. Dr. Wu joins us virtually from Kansas City. Please welcome him to our virtual stage. Good morning, thank you for having me. Um, calling from the comfort of my home in Kansas City, so I'll address a little more casually as you can see. Um, but thank you for having me again. I appreciate uh, the invitation to come speak to you briefly about our work here at the Able Gamers Charity. I think it's really important um, what we're doing. Um, and I'd just like to share just a little bit um, about the different areas that we kind of help. Um, so again, our mission really is to harness issue, um, create opportunities to enable play, but really is to harness the power of video games to connect with people and really to improve the lives of people with disability uh, through recreation and rehab. Uh, we're a really small team um, in peer counseling, but mighty, I feel like that and we're helping individuals every day uh, connect with video games. Um, I have Jesse Hall, who's the director of engineering research and a senior peer counselor on my team who's part-time and Aaron Price, who recently joined us last year, who is a peer counselor that helps people virtually every day. 
Um, some of the player experiences that we um, kind of think about when we think about video games, what are what are people looking for? What are people trying to experience? And I think, um, oh, I'm sorry, are my slides sharing? Uh, yeah, let's just see. Hold on just a second, I'm sorry. There we go. Does that work? Yes, we see it. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So some of the experiences um, when we talk about video games, uh, what are the what are the key experiences that people are trying to have by playing video games? And are there any differences with people with disabilities? Um, through our user research team internally, uh, these are the, the things that people have reported that they seek when they or, or they experience when they play video games, uh, with connection being a really strong. Uh, report that people have, um, but distinctly different for people with disabilities. What we've found is this idea of enablement, that people playing games, video games is very enabling for people with disability. I'm fortunate to, to work with also Stephen Spawn, who's an inspiration to me every day, um, who has this quote, and I'll kind of read it. Um, I believe that there is nothing more powerful for people with disabilities than the freedom that only video games can provide. It is an art form that allows us to to all run, jump, and be whatever we want to be. Plays video games all the time. I watch them stream from time to time as well. Uh, so I really enjoy. I myself play video games. Um, and so how do we go about this work? Uh, we, it was mentioned earlier today, this idea that we need to bake it into uh, what we do, right? And so through our professional development, uh, we interface with uh, game studios, game developers to train them um, and it gets to the point where it's really not about this checklist. So our approach here at Able Gamers is to really focus on patterns, right? To offer the game developers and game studios the flexibility to think about how to design their games, their features, the options, the experiences within gameplays to include more people. So over the number of years that we've been doing this, um, We've trained now over 300 developers across major AAA studios and indie game studios as well. And this is uh, largely an undertaking by my, my colleague, um, Stephen Weitz, who is the Director of Professional Development. The work that I do relates to my team directly is once we have the games, how do we help people with disabilities? So the branch of Able Gamers Peer Counseling that I oversee uh, we provide one-on-one -on -one assistance with players with disabilities um, in order to enable play. So in this picture, we have a screenshot of a Google Meet. I, along with my colleague Aaron Price in the top left, are collaborating with the, the um, gentleman in the middle, Wayne McGrath, who's actually overseas. Uh, we're collaborating with Mina G up in, up in the top right uh, through the hospital system we have it uh, partnered with up in New York, and an engineer, Charles Johnson, who's designing a specific controller for Wayne. All this to, so if, if you're relatively unfamiliar with video games or you love them, I'll kind of talk to you about this real quick, this idea of a feedback loop. We have a child on the left who's interacting with the game on the right. Um, essentially, we're trying to understand through peer counseling and through the games where the breakdown is, where the barriers are, uh, and where the, some of the challenges are um, that we can help players enter this loop of inputting what they want into the game, and then having the game spit out or respond to the player, and then back and forth and back and forth in this in this loop, right? So largely with the, the people that we help, there's a picture of a, uh, a set of standard controllers that we have associated with major consoles, uh, Xbox being the top uh, bottom right, PlayStation being the bottom left, and then the top two are associated with Nintendo <laughs> Switch. Uh, largely, when we think about people with disabilities, um, particularly the ones that Able Gamers is known for helping with, stand, with modified controllers or adaptive gaming setups, we think about disabilities with people with, uh, who are unable to hold these controllers or manipulate the buttons or joysticks associated with that. Um, in 2018, we collaborated with Microsoft and uh, uh, other charities and organizations to develop this Xbox adaptive controller. I'll kind of hold it up to you. The power of this and lies in, if we're all familiar with this, the ability to plug in switches and then really place these switches wherever the player needs. 
And so we have this really flexible tool, this hub of sorts, where we can arrange buttons and joysticks um, in a fashion that's really individualized for the person. Sometimes though, uh, commercial products just don't fit the bill. That's where we kind of talked about earlier, this idea of engineering research, where we kind of figure out what specifically is geared for this particular individual. So this shows a montage of, of photos through a process that we took to develop a custom controller for Wayne McGrath that I referenced earlier in, in one of the slides, where he used a standard arcade stick that he put in a lot of practice with. So being an occupational therapist myself, um, I, I recognize that there are uh, um, a lot of uh, practice. We didn't want to disturb that. So we just wanted to introduce this extra joystick here. And so we, we went the route of retaining most of the buttons in the configuration that he had with his current joystick, but simply adding that. And that took an engineer and took a lot of work. It took several months to actually fabricate this custom box that we sent over to the UK for him. Oftentimes also if commercial products don't really work or are very expensive, as we know in, in with assistive technology, uh, there are 3D printed solutions. The ones pictured above here uh, that my mouse is hovering over are 3D printed solutions for one-handed gameplay. So people with stroke or limb differences that just can't access or have difficulty accessing one side of a controller, these enable the player to push and to manipulate all of the all of the other sides controls. The other 3D printed solutions uh, get to the idea that some people have difficulties grasping or moving the joystick here in these two. And then if these buttons, which are notoriously kind of small with Nintendo switches um, and that the grip is kind of very difficult, we have this 3D printed solution where it enlarges everything and the player can really pull it. So initiative that I oversee also is the Powered by Able Gamers. Um, this is where we are strategically partnering up with hospitals, rehab centers, other nonprofit organizations, community centers, to really provide this uh, nearby location for people with setup. Most of our work happens virtually um, currently with mo most of our um, team, internal team in West Virginia. But we have these locations where people can go and this is powered by Able Gamers. Um, the different ways we support, this is a synchronous um, virtual consultation that we have with um, a rehab engineer at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where we are introducing this gentleman here to a sip and puff device to integrate into his current playing setup. Um, here we have the uh, Cincinnati Children's Medical Center, Hospital Center. Uh, I can't remember the full, full name of that, sorry. Uh, where we're training a lot of occupational therapists, physical therapists, recreation therapists um, to really experience Rocket League here, which you see on the screen, uh, with the standard controllers, because a lot of them are familiar with games themselves. And then from there, we have them try out adaptive solutions. I'm sure Massachusetts has one of these, um, the Assistive Technology Program, the State Act. This is the Texas one. Uh, where before one of the conventions, we hopped on a call to help them troubleshoot some joystick and some switches um, so that they were prepared to go uh, present and spread awareness and to help people in their respective state. Um, I'm most excited about this last picture because it really gets to the point of what we're trying to do um, is to connect people. Um, this is, uh, these are pictures from, the, from Ability KC here in Kansas City where I reside. Uh, where people with disabilities uh, go for rehab, uh, but we are actively inviting people uh, to experience fun and to, to get back to recreation, to get back to this idea that they can play video games. And so you see in this picture on the right, uh, Aaron Price, who goes there one day a week um, as a representative of Able Gamers, um, is helping another person in the middle figure out this quad stick, uh, which uh, is, is a unique controller specifically designed for people with quadru uh, who, are, who are quadriplegic. Um, and that's all I have in our hashtag is so everyone can gain. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Next, I'd like to welcome Rob Dias to the stage. Rob has been at MOD since 2008, starting as a volunteer 
Um, beginning in November, Rob transitioned to his new role as assistive technology information specialist. Uh, in this role, Rob serves as a critical resource to executive branch agencies and government officials who, ac uh, who wish to access the level, assess the level of accessibility with their current and future digital offerings, helping to ensure an equitable experience for all. He recently began providing digital accessibility consulting services free of charge to executive branch agencies, and we hope to expand this offering in the future. Rob will be moderating our much anticipated virtual meeting technology panel. Uh, please welcome Rob and our panelists to the stage. Thank you, Julia, for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Okay. Um, I'm just going to assume I received a standing ovation. So if you're still standing up, please be seated. Um, like Lainey, she had asked for a signal if she's running over time since I can't see. Just please feel free to throw a muffin at me or boo me off the stage. So I'll wait for our panelists. So um, I'm happy to introduce today's virtual meeting technology panel. Uh, representing professionals from Microsoft, Zoom, and WebEx. I want to welcome the panelists and thank them for joining us. And I just want to begin with uh, some brief introductions. I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves. Uh, please provide us with your full name, job title, and again, reiterate the organization that you're with. Um, I'm actually going to start virtually just to make sure everything's going smoothly there. And I'm Apologize, I assume that our, all of our speakers have made it and are up on screen. So I'll ask um, John, please, could you please begin the brief introduction? Sure. Hello, everybody. Hi, Rob. Um, what, a, what a great <laughs> session this has, has been. Um, I, yeah, I'm John Davies, and I'm based here in, uh, in New England, and uh, I'm with Zoom, and I manage uh, state and local governments, and I know uh, many of you on the call, and uh, Thank you for inviting Zoom to be on, on the panel. Thank you, John. And Alex, please. Hey, thank you all for having me. My name is Alex Mook, and I'm the head of Coastal Engineer here at Zoom, um, based out of San Francisco, California, and uh, excited to participate in this panel. OK. Alex, could you just please repeat your title? I am the head of accessibility at Zoom. Sorry. OK. No, thank you so much. And next, we'll go to um, Willette, please. Oh. Hello, my name is Willette Harris. For those of you who are out there, I am a medium brown skin um, African American woman. I have on a brown sweater, and my preferred pronouns are she and her. And above me, I have a blue flower picture in my background. And I am an engineer and product manager with WebEx. Thank you so much, Willette. And next, we have uh, folks here to my left at Microsoft who's in attendance with us today. I, uh, my name is Will Schriever. I am a senior customer success manager uh, for state and local government. Um, I support uh, states of New England uh, and Michigan. Uh, and my primary focus is around uh, teams and modern work. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joshua Bond, a customer success trainer at Microsoft. Just because every title is kind of hard to really understand what it is. Just know to make it simple, my job is to support you with using tools. And when those new features come out, making sure that all of you know how to utilize them, because a tool that exists, if you don't know how to use it, is not useful. Yeah. All right. Thank you uh, all so much for that introduction. Um, we did ask our registrants today to submit some questions. Uh, so we, I have a couple of um, questions that were um, wanted to be asked of the panelists. Um, hopefully, I don't have to refer to my notes. But um, I'll give each panelist an opportunity to uh, answer each question. Um, and again, just feel free if things are going a bit long to just shout out and um, help me move things along. Uh, so the first question is, um, how is accessibility integrated into your design and development processes? So I'll start first with either uh, Josh or Will, if you want to kick us off here. Uh, absolutely. So uh, yeah, we're currently in the process of developing an accessibility centric design process uh, with an emphasis on working along with uh, people with disabilities. Um, we also have a strong uh, disability uh, representation within our org. Uh, our accessibility PM, uh, Brett Humphrey, is blind. An accessibility architect, uh, Chris Sano, who I work with, 
very closely um, is deaf and hard of hearing. Um, and then we also have engineers and product managers uh, who with a variety of disabilities um, who are involved in every aspect of our product development uh, and, of, and process for accessibility features. Um, and uh, as, as Lee Feingold mentioned, um, you know, culture is very important to accessibility. And uh, for us, uh, creating a more inclusive culture has really helped us understand uh, what building an ex uh, inclusive product is like. Um, and uh, we're building features that allow everybody to be their best. And just to add on a couple details in regards to that, because I do love my examples as a trainer. I love context after all. When it comes to inclusivity as well as accessibility, we need to think about both digital as well as physical and shifting between those two, as well as us as individuals when we are speaking and interacting with individuals. So just to give two quick um, tools that are really, really powerful that are getting updated soon, which I'm really excited about. One of them is Office Lens. This is available for everyone. It's been available whether you are a Microsoft customer or not. This allows you to scan physical items convert them digitally, change language, as well as be able to read it out. I was lucky that I was in an Italian restaurant uh, last week. I did not speak Italian. I could barely read the menu. And not only was I able to zoom in quickly and easily, I was also able to make sure I wasn't embarrassing myself when I ordered the lamb dish. <laughs> We've all experienced that. <laughs> as well as one that's really cool is called Coach, coach Rehe uh, Rehearsal Coach. And what this does is allows you to seamlessly before or during a meeting, am I using inclusive language? Am I pronouncing my words easily for everyone to understand? Because many times when it comes to inclusivity and accessibility, we are all in support of it. But sometimes we don't know if we're not being inclusive. Sometimes we don't know if we're being accessible. So having the knowledge and power given to us at our fingertips to make that little extra effort can really make our experience that much better. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and next, um, we'll let, I'll give you a turn at the uh, question. And again, it's how is accessibility uh, integrated into your design and development processes at WebEx? At WebEx, we started off with shifting left, but then we realized that shifting left was not enough, that we had to undergo a complete culture shift. And in that culture shift, what we really did, we focused on providing um, awareness, building empathy, educating our team, and then executing on the things that we are learning. So therefore, our design process, our engineering process, our product requirement definitions are all accessible. And throughout that entire, that entire life cycle here at WebEx, what we really do is we partner with people with different abilities throughout the entire process. So that means, they get early access to our designs and they review them with us, giving us feedback so that we can incorporate that and make sure that we're making the right decisions and that we're not making assumptions. But also in that, what we also do is we do a lot of user studies to make sure that, hey, are we really making the right decisions? And now that we have prototypes out there, can, is it still what users expect to see? But then when we're engineering, we also are doing a lot of testing and making sure that we have outside resources as well as internal resources where we partner with people like our CDAN um, organization, which is our Connected Disabilities Action Network, where they actually partner with us to test our applications as well. And then once we're done with that, we do another cycle where all product UX and engineering all test the product to make sure that the features that we're getting ready to release meet accessibility standards. Because we know that although you may shift left, it's also about making sure that people understand why you're shifting left. So the education part is constantly a big part of what we are doing. So we're constantly educating our team on what accessibility is, the people that accessibility impacts, and the importance of inclusivity as a whole. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, the folks at Zoom, John and Alex, um, again, the question is, how is accessibility integrated into your design and development processes? Sure, I'll take this one. And I think the way I'll explain this is to explain the role of the central accessibility team at Zoom. Um, and I think I'll break it down into three parts, right? The first of which is to listen, to learn. Second is to educate. And the third is accountability. And so uh, first and foremost, right, to listen, to learn, we, our team really takes responsibility in learning 
what is the accessibility beyond just the WCAG, the WCAG, right? Which, you know, great lesson guidelines, right? But there's areas in which you can do better. Uh, use cases and user bases and assistive technologies that you may have not learned, uh, known about that you feel like, and you understand that there are barriers in which you could do better in. And that's our job really to talk with as many, as many users as possible, customers to understand what we can do better. And the second part of that is to take those learning and to educate it to as many teams as possible. So as a central team, right, we take responsibility in making sure that our entire suite of products is accessible and that we're shipping on accessible experiences. And but of course, right, we understand that we can't take ownership and all of that, right? It's a shared ownership. If it was only on one team, you know, that's how you fail, right? We need to ensure that, hey, as designers, uh, as developers, to engineers, uh, product managers and even support agents, you know, anybody that touches the end user experience, they are well versed in what accessibility is and what their responsibility is in making sure that they're deli delivering on accessibility, accessible experiences. And so what the education looks like, right? You know, you have your usual, your trainings, you have your self-serve documentation that's been referred to. And I think most importantly, you have the micro coaching sessions. And what I call those, you know, day-to-day -day interactions that you have with all of these different stakeholders, right? conversations on how you can make this button accessible, conversations on how we make these colors accessible. Uh, these small things are the small interactions, right? Not just the one-time training sessions that they have, but these small interactions are how you kind of build the muscle memory on everyone within Zoom and our entire development process. Then to continually think about accessibility so that it's just not you know, a checklist at the end, right? It's something that you have the muscle memory of continually think, thinking about. Uh, the third part of it is accountability, right? As much as you have all these different stakeholders think about accessibility, there are areas in which they may miss, uh, areas that you know, they may not be aware about. Uh, and that's kind of you know, where our team steps in, right? And talking with the customers, users, and understanding where we fall short, and maybe the more complex areas you know, in which accessibility and usability intersect, where it's not really black and white, it's where we'll provide their input. And so that usually involves reviewing designs, design systems, uh, once we have beta built out, you know, testing it with the suite of business technologies and then, you know, writing requirements right, on how we can do better before the product even released. Um, and it's our job to keep them accountable, right? You know, if we find any issues, things that we should fix, right? We're expecting these to be acceptance criteria, not as new features, but things that you have to, you know, support later down the line if you can't do it right away. And, so, and then from then on, it's from the accountability back to the listening stage, right? Looking at what we've built, uh, how can we improve upon it? You know, getting feedback from customers, disabilities, and then, you know, going back to the, you know, the same loop uh, in which we're integrating accessibility and acting upon what we're hearing. Um, so I, I hope that kind of gives an insight uh, to how we're doing. Do, Alex, I, I just add, you know, for a lot of you, you know, Zoom, we all know Zoom from the pandemic, but prior to the pandemic, um, Zoom's strongest uh, market was in education. And so, from uh, an accessibility perspective, Zoom built the Zoom solution really to address all students. Um, and uh, so that's also one of the reasons that, you know, accessibility is, is, is really paramount for what we do. Um, and then of course it now translates to every other vertical market. And now that we find ourselves doing hybrid, hybrid meetings like we are today, so. All right, well, thank you, John and Alex. Um, so some of you touched upon um, upon the, this topic for this next question, but um, how do you get feedback from and engage with people with disabilities to ensure the accessibility of your products? So uh, could you all, um, we'll start off with um, Josh and Will here um, with Microsoft. Can you speak to uh, the engagement with the community and what sorts of um, initiatives are there with Microsoft to make sure that the voice of the disabled community is being heard? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our accessibility pr product teams uh, have quarterly meetings with uh, customer uh, employee resource groups and uh, different groups to review progress against our commitments towards accessibility um, and make sure that uh, that our you know uh, that we collect the feedback um, from those groups. Uh, but honestly, the majority of the way that we improve our product and get feedback is from everybody who uh, here in the room who uses our product. Um, in, in fact. Uh, if you've worked for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the past couple of years at all, and you've ever uh, attended a Teams training virtually, uh, it might have been led by either Josh or I. Um, and 
and well, that's actually, I laughed when Secretary uh, Wood mentioned, uh, you know, at the start of the pandemic, they were like, yeah, we got, you know, Microsoft 365 and we're, you know, this is all we need, uh, we're ready to go. Um, because us delivering that, those trainings quickly realized that there were gaps in our product uh, that we needed to address and, um, and actually the predecessor in my role worked very closely with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, and our product team to push forward a lot of the improvements that we've made um, when it comes to accessibility in teams and the, the rest of our products as well. Um, and probably more importantly, that uh, we don't, uh, we're not just ensuring that our product is accessible, uh, but all of the other support for that product, the training, the documentation and everything is accessible as well. Um, so uh, it, it's, you know, if, if the product is accessible, that's great. But if it, uh, the resources to learn how to use that product, kind of to Josh's point, uh, are not accessible, then uh, there's a, still a gap there. All right. Absolutely. And just to add on a little bit more, I actually had the pleasure last week of being present at MassCube, one of the biggest educational conferences in the country. Um, really exciting. I hope any of you who see any of the information, keep in mind education is just one side of the coin and the other one is business. All of us who hopefully have a job that got us going through the traffic first thing today. <laughs> but we hear directly from all of you. We hear from students, we hear from educators, nonprofit organizations. I recently had the pleasure of talking with another contact at Seven Hills that works directly with a lot of people in need. So just know your voice matters. It's not just large organizations. And I know we don't always like it, but whenever you're using a tool, whether it's Office, Zoom, any tool out there, when you see that pop up seeing, give us your feedback, what options would you like to see? We do look at them, we do hear your voice and your voice is what drives change. So please take that extra second, we appreciate it. All right, thank you so much. And it sounds like I need both your numbers and speed dial. So <laughs> <laughs> give it to me when we're done. Um, well, that, would you like to um, take a crack at the question? How does uh, WebEx, how do you uh, get feedback and engage with the disabled community? Uh, concerning um, the accessibility of your products? Yes, we do it in various ways here at WebEx. One way is we partner with community organizations that really focus on accessibility throughout as um, uh, a pillar of their um, organizational position. And so that means that we look very closely at different organizations that have different, that focus on different types of disabilities. And then we partner with them and they come in and they do training sessions with us, as well as we bring in um, bi-monthly people with um, different abilities to actually use our products in front of our engineering product team and UX design team, and they get fast feedback. As well as part of that, we do these sessions where if we have a feature coming out and we would like immediate feedback, we actually schedule sessions with a group of individuals that we feel are going to be most impacted by that feature because of their different ability. And they actually will do live, we will ask them to perform specific tasks during those sessions to see exactly if they're able to complete them with the ease of use factor. And then of course we do constantly, we do user studies and um, to make sure that we're making the right decisions because we don't want to assume we know what's best for a group of people or we don't want to assume that every disability is the same. Every person with that disability is the same. So we try to get as much feedback as possible from people with various disabilities to make sure that our product is taking that into account before we release. Okay, thank you so much. And um, John or Alex uh, with Zoom, um, how do you engage with customers with disabilities to ensure um, accessibility of your products? And I also uh, want to go back around once you're done uh, to see if there's a particular way that users can provide um, feedback to um, uh, you all. So uh, John or Alex, feel free to answer the question. Sure, um, really, it's really so much all these, what these folks have expressed already, but I guess, you know, what, the core principle at Zoom here is that everybody and anybody within this organization is encouraged to sit with customers, listen to them, and to understand what the problems are, what the feature requests are, and understand the root cause, of what exactly they're asking. And not only that, but being nimble, taking that to heart, and to act fast on that feedback. And that's very much the same with accessibility as we as with we do everything. And we're very fortunate that we get to work with 
a great number of folks, very intelligent folks, uh, users with disabilities, accessibility advocates in many sectors, such as higher ed, uh, gov. Um, and I think, you know, we meet regularly with them, either monthly, quarterly, ad hoc. And I think even MassDOT has been one of those customers in the past in which we've kind of met together and triage, you know, a number of different feedback on how we can improve our products. Uh, and so again, we take all this to heart and this is how we kind of build and innovate off of uh, the great feedback that we get. And I think an example that I could give is within the field of sign language interpretation. Um, today, you know, in our Zoom meetings today, we have the ASL interpreter kind of it's on its own window. And I think in one of the collaborations that we've had with uh, one of our fully deaf university customers, uh, they've been providing us with tremendous feedback on you know, what works and what doesn't work in you know, this field of sign language interpretation and how there's a greater need for how we are displaying language interpreters today. And I think just a few weeks ago, we released uh, a new feature specifically for sign language interpretation in which you can review the video, right? In a pop down view, resizable, static, that you can move around. And I wish that we were able to use this for today, but perhaps for the next session we will. Um, but this is a great example of how, you know, we're able to really listen and triage feedback in a really fast manner and act upon it. And not only that, right, not just external customers, uh, external users, we have our own set of internal Zoomies who are very passionate about the product, some of which are users with disabilities, and uh, they really serve as a force multiplier in terms of helping educate, you know, product managers, designers, engineers on what we can do better, right? Not just from an accessibility and make, meeting WCAG standpoints, guidelines, but also, you know, from a usability standpoint, right? what are the small things that we can do to improve our products that we can learn from so that we don't make the same mistakes going forward. So uh, lots of different channels of feedback, and uh, I think we just make a strong point of emphasis to act upon it. Yeah, to add really quickly, to, to, just to quickly on that, you know, from a more um, a local perspective, obviously we have that more formal process at Zoom, but Zoom's increased the coverage um, in every part of the country with all of our markets, and I'm I'm a, a, a result of that for state and local government. So I try uh, my best to work with all the, you know, with a, a personal touch locally. And I give that feedback through feature requests. I also engage Alex, who's joined me on many calls with the Commonwealth, with different departments um, to get that feedback. So yeah, it's multi -prong. Great, thank you. And just for the interest of time, um, if, if folks virtually could just put the best way to, to contact, um, to provide feedback, if that's a possibility, just please throw that in the chat. So I'm just gonna move along. Um, of course, we have a pandemic question, which um, funny thing is it, it took me about a year to realize we were under a pandemic because I was just so used to people keeping their distance from me that I just thought it was business as usual. So, but anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> how was the pandemic? And the major increase in remote work uh, affected your priorities around accessibility. And Microsoft, uh, if you want to go ahead. I, I kind of touched on this a little bit in my uh, in my last response to uh, tell you about how when we uh, we first started uh, doing our uh, virtual trainings, we thought uh, you know everything was uh, was where it needed to be and how it needed to be, and quickly realized that wasn't uh, wasn't the case. Uh, but really, I mean that that took uh, it it really uh, forced us forward uh, into ensuring that accessibility becomes a higher priority uh, within our product development. Um, we've uh, rolled out so much to increase the accessibility of our products um, just over the past couple of years based on, uh, on that feedback and research that we've done. Um, and we have so much more that we are going to be announcing uh, over the next few months um, towards that as well. So uh, it really it was a, a catalyst to an accelerated growth um, and, and, and focus of accessibility on our products um, when they became such a, an important part of uh, every day's, everybody's daily life. And just to add on to that, my role and those of my fellow colleagues who support the ease market with training, our role was made because of this shift when, move it a little bit closer, there we go, this shift because of what COVID started. And unfortunately, it took a pandemic like COVID to really jumpstart this. We should have been this much technologically, electronically driven far longer ago. But this is really bringing to the forefront of how can we connect with more people? How can we support people more effectively digitally? And most importantly, how can we give the power to those people on their own 
if they need these tools and features to quickly and easily click something and be empowered by themselves to support themselves, but also to have us backing it. So it's both on the individual and also how we as Microsoft can continue to support. Thank you. Yes, I don't think many of us were prepared for the pandemic. So, um, uh, well, with WebEx, uh, would you care to uh, tell us how the pandemic may have uh, changed um, the priorities surrounding accessibility? Yes, um, at WebEx, right before the pandemic hit, that's when we was beginning our culture shift to really focus in on an inclusive culture and an accessible culture. What the pandemic did was really um, help speed up that process. So we began right away to think about, okay, now that more people are working from home, it also is going to empower a lot more people who were unable to actually become employed to now become employed because now the assistive technologies that they need, they actually have them within their home. So we, we started really doubling down, looking at the things that we might have said we have a workaround for as far as being able to do it in person and really pushing those to the top of the list and really focusing on nailing the basics as well as how do we innovate in these spaces so that we can accommodate for a lot of the things that's going to happen in these remote environments. So we really focused and doubled down on accessibility and the impact that it would have from an innovation standpoint so that we can really create an inclusive culture um, and an inclusive workforce across the board. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And uh, John or Alex with Zoom again, how has the pandemic um, uh, affected your priorities around accessibility? Sure, I'd say it hasn't really shifted priorities. Um, I think early on, accessibility has always been uh, as much as possible what we've tried to put in at the core of do. I think if anything has changed, it's the sense of urgency and the speed at which we're moving with uh, our existing priorities. And I'd say, you know, now more than ever, uh, getting it right from the get go, uh, when, I, when I say right, I mean accessibility is even more important, right? Uh, before, we may have a grace period in which we go to fix debt and address issues later on. But now more than ever, we want to ensure that as much as possible, we are getting things right from the get-go. And that means a lot of shifting left, ensuring that we are moving faster and thinking about just even more, uh, you know, starting from design so that we don't have to fix that later on. But I think more importantly, um, and I think it kind of reflects on what some folks from Microsoft said, is uh, we've seen a sense of urgency in folks on accessibility in areas outside of being people who touch the product, uh, educators, instructional designers, uh, support agents. Uh, we've seen an increased awareness for accessibility across the board and folks that normally wouldn't be as interested in accessibility uh, reach out to us more often and think, you know, how can I get myself involved into this? Um, and so, yeah, I'd say, again, uh, that hasn't changed our priorities, but I feel like the sense of urgency has definitely uh, seen an uptick. All right. Thank you. And um, our final question for the panelists, and we're going to actually stick with um, with Zoom and work my way back to Microsoft. But um, how has the focus on accessibility benefited your company? John or um, Alex, do you care to take that? Yeah, I think I'm just gonna go with a cliche saying here, but I think, uh, you know, it's expand our user base. We, by eliminating barriers, we will see people who, uh, you know, more and more people will be able to use our product to connect and to communicate. Uh, and apart from that as well, we've seen how accessibility benefits everyone. And another cliche, right? But, um, you know, in the past year, for example, uh, we've, definitely focus a lot on our efforts and uh, investments on automated captioning. Obviously not the same thing as card captioning, but there are some users who benefit from automated captioning, but it's this investment in this that we've seen things uh, translate into things like capturing other languages, translating captions, uh, UX improvements or transcript views and you know, subtitle views. And these are features that we've seen are benefiting everyone. Um, even users who may not identify as those with disabilities, are seeing great value from using uh, these features that we've been developing. Uh, and so if anything, right, investing in these features have you know, increased the usability for everyone uh, and really made our platform more open to as many users as possible. Yeah, I, would, I would add too, to it just it, it, what it does is it humanizes, it reminds all of us at Zoom and when you're using the technology, it, 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 it humanizes, it reminds us that it's, 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 uh, it's designed for humans. And, and that, that accessibility is so important, so. Yes, thank you so much. And, and will that final question again is how has a focus on accessibility uh, benefited your company over at WebEx? 
I think it, it has done multiple things for our company over at WebEx. One, it has built a huge amount of empathy within our organization. People now understand the whys behind accessibility. We're no longer looking at it through a compliance lens. We're looking at it through a human lens, right? We understand that it's the people. That's what we're trying to solve for. We're not trying to solve so we can meet a law or a, a guideline. We're trying to solve mm -hmm. so that people can actually work in an environment and feel like they're equal, regardless of their different abilities. But it also has drive a culture of innovation, a constant culture of innovation that really allows us to focus on how do we make our product better? It's not creating an accessibility feature, it's creating a feature that allows us all to work better. And that just so happens to allow someone with a different ability to actually do something that they were unable to do before, that's great. But we all benefit when our products are accessible because innovation fosters at WebEx. And that's what we really noticed. But it also created a culture of having open and honest conversations, not being afraid to ask the questions and ask people with different abilities, questions around their ability, so that we can gain understanding, so that we can know exactly what's going on without assumptions. And so it also led us to having a more educated, uh, aware, and empowered culture at WebEx. And that's something that we are really continually striving for. We understand that accessibility and compliance is one thing. We understand that without exclusivity, Without accessibility, you cannot have inclusivity and all of those things. But at the end of the day, what really matters is, are you impacting the people in the right way? And that's what our main focus is at WebEx. And that is what has been interwoven into our culture now. And that has been a big, huge focus. And that's one of the biggest changes by focusing on accessibility that we have seen throughout our entire organization. Thank you. I, I appreciate the passion in your voice and thank you so much. And uh, last but not least, uh, Josh, Will, um, how has the uh, focus on accessibility uh, benefited your, your company or your, your, your teams there at Microsoft? You don't get to go first this time, Will. We're going in reverse order. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got to have some fun mm -hmm. on a Thursday after all. Um, Microsoft always leads. And as someone who's been with the company for, I think it's been six or seven years at this point, I've lost count. We lead with inclusivity and the importance of everyone having a voice. And as we all know, we all have different voices and how our voice is heard is often different. And some people need support in regards to that. That voice could be an innovation for tomorrow. It could be pushing the conversation forward or just allowing you to support one of your colleagues in a way that normally they wouldn't get. And as a trainer, I, I will say straight up, I personally don't deal with regulations or anything like that. I'd work directly with all of you of what matters to you, what works for you, and what you want to do through the day-to-day. -day. So it's all about driving that engagement with all of you, driving how you're meeting and conversing, and making it so that what you're working on today hopefully can happen faster and help support more people than ever before. And I also think it ties directly into Microsoft's mission statement, which is to help uh, help every person and organization in the world achieve more. Uh, and so if we are allowing folks uh, who you know may have uh, had accessibility needs that weren't met before to start to be able to uh, you know uh, leverage the technology and achieve more, then, we're meeting our mission statement and that's good for us. I also, I, I wanna uh, just tie back to something that uh, Alex from Zoom said, which is uh, it, it also it has uh, increased the number of people like myself who prior to uh, the prior to the pandemic uh, was not really someone who was uh, plugged into the accessibility space. Um, but because I've uh, had such an increased understanding um, and realization of the importance, uh, it is I've become an, a, an accessibility advocate and champion um, a, along the way. So great. Thank you so much. Well, I hope. I didn't run over time. I didn't get hit with any muffins, so that's good. <laughs> I want to uh, sincerely thank um, all the panelists today for joining us uh, and, and being honest with your uh, uh, feedback and questions. Uh, thank you for keeping us connected to our loved ones and friends and families over the pandemic. 
and thank you for um, allowing us to remain employed uh, with your tools at our disposal. So uh, thank you all so much. Thank you all for coming. And I think uh, Julia or Mary. Thank you. Ram is much taller than that. One oh one, perfect. Do you want me to end it all? Or oh, you want to say a few Stop things? Sure. Okay. Thank you so much to everyone, all of our speakers, um, Secretary Wood, Attorney Laney Feingold, our panelists. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, the town of Arlington. And of course, I have to thank the MOD staff. Um, I have a great staff and they're committed to all of this in moving forward with accessibility. I think it would be hard to work for the Massachusetts Office on Disability without an additional passion in, in, in this area. And Lilia, the communications manager, has put so much time into this. I happen to know she was working till 1030 at night the other night. Um, there's been a lot of work done behind the scenes for this successful event. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I want to thank the cart reporters, the ASL interpreters, the people that set up the table, the people that put the tablecloths on, the people that presented the food. You know, it, it takes a lot of different people to put something like this on. And, um, you know, I appreciate the, the time and attention that everyone has given. And please stay tuned for Massachusetts Office on Disability Future Events. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. Um, we still have a long way to go to achieve fully inclusive and accessible digital environment. Um, but we hope that today's summit has left you feeling inspired to build that accessible digital world with us. And we hope that you've made some connections today that will help you along your journey. If your question wasn't answered here today, or you're craving more knowledge and conversation about digital accessibility, please join MOD for our virtual quarterly tea with MOD on Wednesday, November 16th. We will be answering your questions and continuing this conversation about digital accessibility. Information and registration for the quarterly T is on MOD's website and will be emailed to all summit registrants next week, along with a recording of today's live stream. Thank you again for joining us today, whether in here in person or home via live stream. If you're here in person, please remember to return your name tag on the way out and grab a muffin or a fruit cup. There are a lot left. Yes, and, and one more thing, if I could keep you for another minute, I wanted to also thank Sarah Bourne again. Um, congratulations on the Tom Hopkins Award. And I'd like to thank our host, uh, MGH Brigham for, 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 for giving us this venue for free, which was a wonderful partnership. And lastly, the New England Americans with Disabilities Act, the New England ADA Center. Uh, we, Massachusetts Office on Disability, is their state affiliate for Massachusetts. And they are the ones that funded this event. So thank you to the New England ADA Center. Please take a pumpkin, take the pumpkins from the table. Um, if no one really cares one way or the other, the person who has the next birthday, whether it's today or a birthday coming up, take the pumpkin, throw some candy in your pocket and please take food, there's extra, it needs to be eaten, thank you. <laughs>